Welcome, Hearth and Homies. Tonight's compilation is Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Now, this show was broadcast from 1949 to 1953 and was created by Blake Edwards. That's right, the same guy that brought you Breakfast at Tiffany's, The Pink Panther, and many other films, was the creator and driving force behind Richard Diamond. Now, Dick Powell starred as Diamond, and he was portrayed as a wisecracking <laughs> private detective. Now in the show, Diamond is a former police officer who has a standard fee of $100 a day plus expenses. Diamond has a uh, working relationship with Lieutenant Walter Levinson, who is his former partner. And most shows end with Diamond back at his girlfriend Helen Asher's penthouse apartment, where he sits down at the piano and sings a tune. Now this show is in <laughs> probably my top five favorites. It's a show, obviously, it doesn't take itself too seriously. Uh, there's a lot of humor in it. It's just a very fun show to enjoy. And I really enjoy Dick Powell. I'm just like fascinated with him. Not only is he like a great actor, I also see him as like a big entrepreneur. He just always had the ability to kind of reinvent himself and get involved in other aspects of business. And he really uh, was able to expand his career through different mediums. And I've just always found him very interesting. Now, he was the first actor to portray Philip Marlowe on the big screen and also on the radio in the Lux Theater adaptation of Murder My Sweet. Now, just prior to this show, he had auditioned for Yours Truly Johnny Dollar, but decided to continue with Richard Diamond instead. But we'll talk more about Powell in future compilations. As for tonight's show, we've taken this classic old-time radio show and paired it with video of beautiful scenery to give you a unique old-time radio viewing experience, the OTR Visual Radio. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Portions of the following are transcribed. Here is Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Yeah. Down, up, round, and down. Mr. Diamond, I presume? Yes, and maybe no. Down, up, round, and round. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand you. Uh, yes, I'm Diamond, and you're not presuming on me, not if you're a client. Well, no, that's not what I mean. What is that object you're playing with? Uh, this? This is a yo-yo. You make it go down, up, round, and down. See? Uh, yes, yes. But, but I came in on business, Mr. Diamond. I want to hire you. Just drop it like this. Down, up. As a detective. Oh. Well, a hundred a day in expenses, and I throw in the yo-yo lessons free. Give me the Mr. Diamond. Are you in business? Do you have the hundred a day? I do. I am. That's fine. Your name? Oh, I, I can't tell you that. Goodbye. Will you kindly put that thing away? I have a terrible head. Oh, I don't know. It's not so bad. Carve it yourself. Why, you insufferable... Now, wait a minute. Until we've had a formal introduction, the word insufferable is your ticket for a new set of dentures. Now, why don't we get formal and save your gums that lonely feeling? I told you my name is not important. That I believe, but let's kick it around anyway. Is that necessary? Look, look, you said you wanted to hire me. So either tell me your name or what you wanted me to do, or let me get back to my practicing. Uh, I, I should find another detective, but you came highly recommended, so... All right. Uh, you can call me uh, Johns. Other wife? What? Forget it. Initials on your briefcase read J.B. Oh, oh, that, it, it's one I borrowed. So, now that I've conquered your coyness, what's the pitch? Pitch? Oh, oh, you mean my assignment. Oh, it's very simple, but first, I must insist that no word of this conversation leaves your office. So far, no one would believe it anyhow. But my ethics are in good order, Mr. Johns. Good, good. This must be kept very secret. Shall I pull down the blinds and stuff the keyhole? Oh, that shan't be necessary, thank you. Your secret is... Uh, murder, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I just knew you were going to say that. Where's the corpse? Uh, the corpse? Oh, that's what I came to you for. I want to have professional advice on every angle before I kill. Now, you've had police experience. Uh, I... Unless my hearing aid's on the blink, you're saying you want to commit a murder. Oh, not want. I'm going to. This evening. Oh. What do you want me for? The victim? Oh, I have the victim. The opportunity. Method. Uh, and the man to handle the uh, details. However, I want to be sure that I'm not tripped up by my lack of foresight to police procedures. Uh, sure, 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 yeah. Uh... Whom are you calling? The police, but you'll probably get sent to Bellevue. Mr. Diamond, your ethics. Ethics about concealing or helping a murder are free passage to Sing Sing. The phone, put it down quickly. Oh, my. Isn't that shiny, a real gun? Those things are illegal, you know. 
Must you shake it so much? Uh, oh, uh, sorry, I, I'm a little nervous. Oh, so well, you're nervous. Uh, quiet, quiet, I'm thinking. This visit has obviously been an error. Perhaps not a fatal one. Let's see. I have it. Into the closet. What? With my bicycle? It'll be too crowded. Your bicycle? Or oh, my exercise bicycle. That's my, there's my rowing board and oh, my, my weight. Oh, be quiet. Stop walking. Oh, this is ridiculous. Now open that door. Oh, okay. Uh, now that bicycle. It has a seat? Well, yes. Sit on it. So the Diamond Detective Agency sat in the stuffy closet listening to the sound of the desk being pulled over and jammed against the door. Not having anything better to do except call myself names, I rode. On my fifth lap around the world, I gave birth to a brainchild and began applying the art of leverage against the blockaded door using both legs and the flat of my back. Result? A charley horse. On the third lap following, I came up with something more substantial. A heavy barbell. Four smashes and three torn ligaments later, the thin door collapsed over the desk, blocking it. I picked my way over the debris, trying to focus my eyes to the light. By instinct, more than sight, I found the phone. But as I reached to pick it up, I suddenly realized I was shaking hands with someone. Back up, Diamond. Oh, this is getting ridiculous. All my clients waving guns at me. I'm no client, Diamond. Mr. Johns once says you keep your company for a while. Oh, well, you're a small one. This gun makes me a big one, Diamond. Real big. That's why my nickname is Big Man, even though I'm only four feet tall. Oh, well, maybe I could help you. I've got a lot of exercise things. Be funny or shut up. How about a few yo-yo lessons? <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. Shut up. Big man, what would happen if I took that gun away from you? You want to try? Uh, I was giving it a thought. But on second thought, uh, no. Yeah, smart Shamus. I can empty this magazine in your stomach before you make two steps. It... Rick, I... Oh, I didn't know you had a client. Take it easy, Diamond. I got a gun in my pocket. Uh, the, uh H Helen, Helen, baby, come in. Uh, uh, meet big man McCarthy, an old, old pal from PS69. Big man, this is uh, Miss Asher. Oh, yes, delighted, Mr. McCarthy. Hey, same here, chick. Say, pal, you got good taste. Some built. Oh, <laughs> such a flatterer. Rick, what happened to your closet? Uh, the termites broke my non-aggression pact. Uh, what's on your mind, baby? Well, I came to see if you were ready for the benefit tonight. You are, aren't you? Oh, well, am I? Just watch this new yo-yo trick. They call it round the world. Oh, wonderful. Oh, Rick, you know so many things. Where'd you learn that? A PS 69, of course. Where else, Mr. McCarthy? Do it again, Rick. I want to see how you do it. Sure, baby, just watch. You take it in your hand like this and throw it out like this. <laughs> oh, Rick. Rick, you struck that poor little man. No. Well, that poor little man had a big nasty gun in his pocket and it was pointed right at my breakfast. Why, that horrible little... Why didn't you hit him harder? He might have hurt you. Oh, darling, are you sure you're all right? I'm sure, baby. Well, you send for the police. He should be behind... Now, look, Helen, this is my department. You'll go along with your errands. Rick, he's dangerous. Helen, will you go away? I have a few questions I want to ask this little hood, and you'll be of no help, believe me. Well, all right, but you be careful. Oh, and uh, about tonight. It's not at my apartment, but the park is penthouse up above in the same building. Now, come early and help Francis and me get things ready. Stop pushing. I'll see you tonight, baby. Oh, Rick. Are you sure I can't stay? Go, scat. Now, for you, Mr. Big Man. Come here. Wake up. Wake up. The mule train went that way. Come on, come out of it. Ah, uh, that's uh, you, huh? Yeah, me. Now, what's the real name of your boss? Who's he going to kill? You can stop the questions, Diamond. I'm not going to talk. You want me to wring it out of you like a wet wash? Who is Mr. Johns? You know, there's a big advantage in being little, Diamond. Yeah, you can hide under smaller rocks. <laughs> Who's your boss? There's another advantage, too. A man my size can be awfully hard to catch. What? Hey, come back here. Oh. <laughs> he never looked so good. Shut up, Otis. He's really been worked over. Wonder what gang did this to him. Rick. Rick, snap out of it. Oh, oh. Rick, what happened? Oh, I just came through the door. Oh, what? 
coming through the door couldn't wreck you like that. Oh, without opening it? You mean... Oh, no. You got that shiner by running into the door? <laughs> Shut up, Otis. Okay, Rick, where's the body? Uh, beside you. Well, that's Otis. I mean, where's the corpse? Uh, the corpse isn't a corpse yet. Otis, get my bicarbonate. Hey, Yellowton. Go on, Rick. The corpse isn't a corpse. Tell me, what is it? A ghost? Exactly. Otis? He, he Yellowton. Mm. Now, Rick, do me a favor. Please tell me what you're talking about. Oh, you aren't trying, Walt. All I said was that the corpse isn't a corpse yet and that it's a ghost because I don't know who's going to be the corpse. Rick, before I go stark raving mad, will you tell me what you're talking about? Well, a man came into my office this morning, said he was going to commit a murder. Threw a gun on me when I started to call you. Locked me in a closet. I broke out only to find he left this little man, big man, the midget who just ran out of here. Stop, please. So Helen came in. I turned the tables on big man. She left. I asked questions, drew a blank. Big man started to run. Why didn't you nab him? He ran through the door. I ran into it. You're up to date. <laughs> I'm up to date. Get him. I'm up to my ears in confusion. So we've got a man who's going to murder someone. All right, what's his name? He said Johns, but it's a phony. Initials on his briefcase read J.B. Uh, say, Shamus, what do you look like? Uh, Otis, do you have a son? Oh, you know I don't. Well, that's what he looked like. Rick, are you sure this J.B. is planning to kill someone tonight? Well, if he isn't, he sure took a lot of pains for nothing. Let's get down to headquarters. I want to check the files. Well, okay, but we don't keep files on ghosts. Oh, by the way, why did you come up here? Helen called. Said you were holding a pigeon for us. Oh, lovely girl. I'll say... Can I have a dance with her at the benefit tonight? Uh, no, Otis. I think i better fix you up with Francis. Swell. Otis, you gravel-head Francis is a butler. Oh, it's all right, Lieutenant. I like them foreign dames. Well, that's all the pictures, Walt. I've looked them all. Johns doesn't have a record, neither does a big man. Well, they wouldn't. The one time we get a chance to stop a murder before it's committed, and we've even got a good description of the potential killer. Well, this, this J.B. was no bum. Not even an ordinary working man. His clothes are expensive, and the briefcase he carried probably cost more than your weekly salary. Now, it's an even bet he belongs to the social upper crust. That or close to it. Well, that would narrow the field a lot, but still... How I... about the newspapers, Walt? They have society reporters who know anyone who is anyone... It's a long shot, but name, name me a better. You could go through the newspaper logs. They might have a picture of Oh, some... no, no, Walt, no pictures. I'm nearly blind from looking at pictures now. Thanks, but I'll try the reporters with a description. You sounds like you're going to search for a needle in a haystack. Oh, Otis, please, your cliché is showing. Ah, uh, that's screwy. You can't kid me. Only dames wear clichés. How could mine be showing? Sergeant, when you die, will your brain to a clinic? Maybe they'll discover a cure for it. Ah, oh, lay off. Besides, I got a good idea for your investigation. I wouldn't miss hearing this for my next two issues of Batman. Yeah, I was thinking you could maybe save a lot of time if you got an artist to draw a picture from your description. They do it in all the movies and catch crooks easy. Otis, how would you like a transfer hey, to Walt. Staten? Wait a minute, wait a minute. He may have an idea. I know where there's an artist who could sketch J.B. from a description. It's crazy, but you may as well try it, Rick. Otis, you can drive him there. Uh, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, tell him yes, Walt. I can't stand to see him cry. All right, Otis. You can use the siren. <laughs> Come on, Otis. It's right at the head of the stairs. Uh, who is this guy? Her uh, name's Vladimir, and be careful. He's temperamental. Oh, that's okay. I've been vaccinated. What, what, what? Open up, Vladimir. Runga Go away. My name's Patrick O'Brien. It's Diamond, not the landlord. Comrade, come in. Stalin. No, Vladimir. That's Sergeant Otis. Oh. What a startle he gave me. Uh, Vladimir, can you sketch a man's face from a description? Can I sketch a man's face from a description? Can I sketch... Did I not once sketch the whole Russian army? And with one pencil? Okay, Vladimir, but can you do it? Comrade, you doubt it? I am the greatest artist that's impossible. I can draw... Uh, 
Comrade, you are paying cash money. Cash money? Oh, for that I can draw you Siberia and never miss a salt mine. I'm such a genius, I can't stand myself. Another man, Vladimir. Can you sketch the man's face? I think so. Okay, but make it fast. I'll give you the general idea and correct you as you go. Corrections you can make. One criticism, I go back to my chef cream signs. Come with me to my hizzle. <laughs> Well, almost, Vladimir, but the nose still isn't quite right. Make it look a little more like a pickle. Sweet? Dill. Off that side, just a pinch. Oh, like this? Yeah, yeah, you've done it. That's him. Ah, how much do I owe you? For you, comrade, hundred dollars. What? Fifty dollars. A buck. S sell my genius for a buck? <laughs> I die first. A buck and a quarter. Comrade, please, I'm a capitalist now. A buck and a half. Last price. I wouldn't... Last, pr last price, I take it. But I may die. If you do, give me a call. It's a good job, Vladimir. Uh, of course. Was I not the artist to sketch the Tsar himself? Of course, it didn't pay so well, but it was great honor. Looks pretty fuzzy to me. Comrade Diamond, your patronage I appreciate. But if you must bring along this peasant, don't. Even his face makes me sick with the repulse. Uh, oh, this, come on. You'll have to pardon him, Vladimir. Whenever his shoelaces come untied, his brain slip out. See you later. Oh, Chichornia, comrade. When we left Vladimir, I sent Otis back to Walt and took off for the newspapers. I showed the sketch to one society reporter after another and watched so many heads shake, my eyes began to cross. It was 6.30 when I finished playing Quizmaster, and there was no use kidding myself. I had struck out. I had to tell Walt, so I started for the 5th Precinct. I was at a point where I'd have hocked my social security for 30 seconds with a little big man. Then as I walked down the street, I suddenly felt the nerves in my spine jump down into the pit of my stomach and goose pimples skidded up my back like scared rice. It was a feeling I'd had before. So without turning, I headed for the steps of a basement apartment. <laughs> Well, I got my meeting with Big Man all right. And it came within inches of being a vamp into a Gabriel solo. Big Man apparently thought his shots hit pay dirt. But when I peeked over the top of the stairs, he was in his car and going. I took in the torn knees of my pants, said a few messages to the spirit world that would have barred me from any seance, and hauled what was left of the Diamond Detective Agency to see Walt Levinson. Well, you can have it, Walt. This is getting ridiculous. Beating my brains out, getting shot at, and for what? Shot at? That's right. I said shot at. You can have the whole stupid mess. I like to get fees for playing post office with slugs. And if a guy gets killed, call me. I'll help with the embalming. But, but... Oh, but nothing. It's seven o'clock, and I'm not sticking around to split a three-way crying job over a killing that may already have happened. I'm going to Helen's and get a drink. Oh, all right. Go ahead, Rick. There's nothing more you can do anyhow. I'll see you later. All right. And you stop looking like a panda with a bellyache, Otis. No, what did I do? Oh, shut up. Uh, hey, where you going? I'm going out and punch the first little guy I can find right in the nose, just on general principles. I left the precinct and headed for Helen's party. I remembered that the benefit was being held in the penthouse and went on up. I was surprised to find Helen's butler, Francis, opening the door. Good evening, Mr. Depp. Oh, my, did you have an accident? This day has been an accident, Francis, but if you mean my clothes, I was playing spin the bottle with a bulldozer. You do look a little battered, if I may say so, sir. You ought to see the bulldozer. What are you doing opening the door up here? Oh, the Parker's butler was taken ill, sir. As I was helping Miss Asher with the decorations anyway, I remain to take his place for this evening. Is she here? Yes, yeah, she's in the living room, sir. Thanks, I'll go on in. Hello, baby. What? Get you a bus? Just a door and a sidewalk. The bus I get later. Oh, Rick. And just look at your suit. It's ruined. Now, uh, what's with the concern over my suit? You lobbying for my tailor? I wanted you to look your very best tonight. Here, let me see those knees. Come on, sit over here. That's it. Now... Oh, well, they're not as bad as I thought. Oh, cheer up. Maybe they'll get infected. That'll help. 
Who did this to you, Rick? Our sweet little friend of this morning, Big Man, or I should say his boss, J.B. He's the one who sent Big Man after me. J.B.? A specter sent to haunt me for my past sins. He hired the little killer you saw me sock with my yo-yo. Your yo-yo? Oh, you haven't lost your yo-yo, have you? Oh, Helen, baby, your Ricky's nearly been killed. Must you worry about my yo-yo? I'm sorry, but it is all right. In my pocket, here. See? Good as new. Oh, that's fine. Now, what about this J.B. person? Why did he send Big Man to kill you, Rick? Because I know he's going to commit a murder tonight. Maybe doing it right now. Wait a minute. You said Big Man. Did you let him go this morning? Uh, yeah, yeah, I let him go. And I've worn my feet off up to my eyebrows trying to find out who his boss is and who's on the spot to get knocked off. Oh, poor Ricky. I wish I could help you. It's not me that needs help now. I quit. It's the guy J.B. is after. J.B., uh, are those his real initials? Yeah. No, we've had lots of things to go on. Initials, descriptions, even a sketch of him. Here, I've got it in my pocket for all the good it did. No, wait, don't tear it up. Let me look at it. Oh, Rick, silly. This is no murderer. That's a sketch of Johnny Blackwell. It's a... Helen, you know who this man is? Of course. It's Johnny Blackwell from Newport. He and his wife are up here visiting Adam Worcester. Rick, what is it? You're... You're all turning blue. All day long, I... When you were in my office, you could... Oh, if I'd only asked... Helen. Yes, Rick? Give me some cyanide, no water. Oh, but you must be mistaken about the sketch. Johnny Blackwell can't be a murderer. Well, I'm getting out of here. Where can I find him? If you'll just sit still, he'll come to you. Adam Wister's bringing him and his wife to the benefit tonight. Well, that's the way the screwy world works sometimes. One minute you're on your uppers. With a stick of baloney, you're trying to hold off three guys with swords... And Kismet makes a switch and tags your side for a gain in your living. I called Walt to pass on the good news, and in eight and a half minutes by the clock, he joined me with Sergeant Otis in the kitchen from where we could peek out at the growing crowd. Let me take a look, Rick. Has Blackwell come in yet? Uh, stay back. I'll let you know. Otis, get out of that ice box. Oh, I'm hungry. You heard me. Oh, there's fried chicken, Lieutenant. Fried chicken? Hmm, I haven't had... Otis. Oh. Walt, Walt, come take a look. There's Blackwell. Where? Over there, just sitting down. The man with the sandy hair. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Who are those people with him? Well, the woman must be his wife. Oh, but get a load of the little weasel. That's big man, the guy who got away from me this morning. Oh, and the other man? Must be Adam Wister. Helen said he was bringing the Blackwells. Well, he did, so now we wait for the play. Well, we waited and watched the Blackwell party settle down to enjoy itself. Big man acted like he hadn't eaten for a week and made hors d'oeuvres vanish in his mouth like marbles down a manhole. After what seemed like weeks, the situation grew, suddenly took shape. On Blackwell's urging, Big Man rose to dance with Mrs. Blackwell. Mrs. Blackwell was a dark-haired honey with curves right out of one of my better dreams. But my mind was on her husband and Worcester. As soon as they had the chance, they got up and headed out of the room. Watch them, Rick. They're headed for the library. Come on, this way. Through this door and down the hall. Well, Adam, it's nice to be visiting you again. We're glad to have you, Johnny. We're sorry to hear about your losses in the market last year. The story here was that you were cleaned out. Hey, Diamond, what's he saying? Shut up, Oh, oh I still have a little money, Adam. In fact, I'd like to buy back in with you as a partner. You don't have that much, Johnny. And your wife won't give it to you. She may, Adam. She may, and quicker than you think. Walt, come on. We've picked no, the wrong victim. Let's find the big man. Hey, it's nice on the terrace, Mrs. Blackwell. Yeah, real nice out here. I don't like it. It's chilly. Oh, it'll warm up, Mrs. Blackwell. No, I'm going back in. Better not. I don't like the way you're acting, big man. Get out of my way. Get back and shut up. How dare you talk to me like that, you little... Now I'm big, Mrs. Blackwell. Real big. <gasps> a gun? What in the world? I'm gonna kill you. Kill me? Yeah. Only it'll look like an accident. 
Why, this is ridiculous. What kind of a joke is this? <laughs> it's no joke, Mrs. Blackwell. Your husband don't think it's no joke. He wanted me to tell you he was real sorry. Now I'm going to kill you. You mean it. You really mean it. Yeah, sure, Mrs. Blackwell. Mr. <gasps> Blackwell needs your dough bad. Back up. He can have it, all of it. Only don't kill me, don't. Sorry, Mrs. Blackwell, too no. late. Now start back. Please, please. Over to that wall, you're going to play Humpty Dumpty. Oh. That's right. Now oh, get up no. on the wall. No. I'm a guy who's willing to help you. Me too. Diamond, why you... Catch the girl, Walt. Big man's mine. He he was going to kill me. All (laughs) right, Mrs. Blackwell. Take her inside, Otis. Rick, you okay? Yeah, getting my hands on this little rat was better than a year's vacation. Well, we sure heard enough to give both him and Blackwell a long vacation on the state. Keep him on ice. I'll collect the other one. I'll be delighted. Uh, Oh, my joy. Oh, waking up... Uh, What a shame. (laughs) What a lovely party. I do love these informal get-togethers, don't you, big man? It was short but very sweet, the wind-up of the no-one-was-murdered case. The score was the kind to make you forget you didn't get a fee. Two killers caught, no victims. When I saw Walt take the little big man, not so big without his gun, and his boss Blackwell off to the Bastille, my worries melted like a snowman in a blast furnace. And speaking of melting, the lovely Mrs. Blackwell showed signs of being upset. So, what could I do but console the pretty little thing? Oh, Mr. Diamond, I think you were so wonderful and brave. Oh, you show a few nice points yourself, Mrs. Blackwell, and call me Rick. You saved my life, Rick. And call me Rita. You can get to the point quick. Why, Rita? Oh, there you are, Mrs. Blackwell. I know you must be terribly upset. Well, Rick has been a great comfort to me. I'll bet he has. But I've arranged for Francis to take you home. Uh, now. Now? Oh, well, thank you, Miss Asher. And Rick. Yes? Don't worry about the name calling. Just say, hey, you. I'll know what you mean. I think I know what you mean. By you. Well? So help me, I'm innocent. With lipstick on your collar? That Otis. I've warned him to be careful with my shirts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, time for my yo-yo act? Your act. I... Oh, Rick, uh, about that... No, now, now, look. I've worked my finger to the bone practicing. Don't tell me. Why, you specifically asked me to be here tonight. I, I know. And come on with me over to the bandstand. Oh, no. No, you don't. I'm an artist tonight, not a singer. No sing, no yo-yo. You mean if I sing, I can do my yo-yo act? If you make it pretty. Ah, uh, it's blackmail, but I'll do it. Well, you stay right here. I want to talk to the orchestra leader. Okay, I'll practice. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Richard Diamond, his piano, and his yo-yo. <laughs> Sing good, Rick. Like a robin with a sponsor. present an exhibition of dexterity. Now? Now. Oh, no, Shamus, no. You're doing it all wrong. You gotta use more wrist action. Oh, to stay out of the act. Oh, come on, let me show you. Here, give it to me. Now, you, you start it down, like this. Helen. Yes, Rick, he's better. Uh, let's go home and Nick. Wait till I get my hat. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Hans Conried, Grace Albertson, Sidney Miller, and High Everback. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions of the program were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. (laughs) Now this is Tal Avery inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective.
Saturday night is packed with entertainment when you stay tuned for NBC's star lineup of shows. There's always a program of interest on NBC. Now stay tuned for Edward G. Robinson and the Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. Well, it's Christmas Eve. And every year about this time, my business takes a big nosedive. People usually pack up their troubles and start unpacking colored lights and Christmas tree ornaments. So tonight, instead of telling you about one of my hair-raising exploits, we're going to tell you a Christmas story. So with apologies to Mr. Charles Dickens, we'd like to bring you an adaptation of one of his most famous stories, A Christmas Carol. Now, I'd uh, better explain something first. This version isn't exactly the way you've heard it many times before, because the particular type of characters I usually get mixed up with, this story is written to fit their talents and characteristics. Different from the Dickens original, certainly, but we feel that this story could easily happen today, anywhere. Like maybe right here in New York, on a little side street just off the Bowery. So now I'd like to introduce our characters. Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge will be played by my good friend and guiding hand of the 5th Precinct Homicide Division. Lieutenant Walter Levinson. Walter? Oh, yes. <clears throat> the character of Jacob Marley will be played by one of my dearest friends and constant companions. Otis, that's you. Huh? Oh, uh, Sergeant Otis Loveloon. Loveloon. <laughs> Walsh. Oh, uh, sorry, Helen. <laughs> uh, Tiny Tim will be played by our corner newsboy. Johnny Rollins. Uh, Tiny Tim's mother will be played by my red-headed gal friend. Hello, Nash. The rest of the characters will be played by members of the 5th Precinct Police Station. Officer O'Reilly. Officer Lund. Officer Lefkowitz. Sergeant Miller. <laughs> the music will be furnished by the 5th Precinct Police Band, directed by Patrolman Worth. And now, our version of the Christmas classic, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Once upon a time, there was a nasty old guy named Ebenezer Scrooge. He was nasty, all right. He didn't like anything, except maybe all the dough he could get his hands on. Scrooge had a little business that he started with his partner, Jacob Marley. The outfit was known as Scrooge and Marley Loan Company. But one day, poor old Marley just up and keeled over. So the boys along the big street gave him a nice funeral, and old Scrooge took over the business. Well, Marley had been dead for seven years, and Scrooge lived alone in his little room over the office. And for a hobby, he hated everybody. He had a young guy working for him by the name of Bob Cratchit. Bob had a wife and four kids and made just enough to make ends meet. Scrooge used to ride him all the time. When it got so cold the polar bears complained, Cratchit would turn on the little heater, and Scrooge would say, Cratchit, what do you think you're doing? Turn on the heat, that's what I'm doing. My fingers look like popsicles. Well, I don't care if they come in six delicious flavors. Every time you turn on that heater, it costs me money. Business is not good, so get back to your work and turn off the heat. Oh, now look, Mr. Scrooge, I'm freezing. Now, this pen ain't guaranteed to write under ice. I tell you once more, get back to your work. Okay, Mr. Scrooge. I don't know why you worry about business. Why not just put up a sign, turn the joint into a skating rink? Well, this was no time for any decent guy to act like that. It was Christmas Eve. Along about five o'clock into the office came Scrooge's nephew, Fred. Well, Merry Christmas, Bob. Oh, Merry Christmas, Fred. You get back to your work, Cratchit. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Oh, swell. Merry Christmas. Uh, humbug. Humbug? Yeah, humbug. My old man didn't like Christmas, and that's what he used to say. Humbug. Okay, humbug. But it's still Christmas, and I don't see where you get off not liking it. This is supposed to be the time everybody gets with it. 
Everything stops. It ain't much good, and you put your arm around the next guy, you tell him Merry Christmas. I'll put my arm around you with a hammer on the end of it if you don't lay off that goodwill stuff. Look, what's with you? What have you got against Christmas? You show me a way to make a hundred bucks every Christmas, and I'll fall in love with it. Every time the holidays roll around, nobody pays their bills, and they all run around like they own the Chrysler building. Look at you. Sixty bucks a week, and you're coming on like Rockefeller. Well, sure, I make a lousy sixty bucks, but it ain't easy. But once a year, something happens with everybody in this big world. Well, nearly everybody. <sighs> because this is a day that somebody else started to make things right for us. And he had a really tough time doing it. It's more than just remembering. It, it, it's feeling. It, it's all around you. Christmas has got to be merry. Don't you get it? You want me to be merry? Well, sure. Then go get some of these joyous clients of mine to pay off their loans. The missus asked me to invite you over for dinner tomorrow. Now, don't hold your breath. Okay. Merry Christmas, Bob. Merry Christmas, Fred. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Uh, humbug. Late that evening, Scrooge went upstairs to his room, the room where Jacob Marley used to stay. It was dark in the little hall, and when Scrooge reached for the door, he looked up at the big brass knocker and saw... <gasps> Holy cow! I could have sworn that was old Jake's face in the knocker. I must be working too hard. So in he went. A little shaky after seeing Jake Marley's face, but he just passed it off his nerves. He closed the door and locked it, then went over and sat down in front of the fireplace. He got a fire going and started to relax. But every tile around the fireplace started looking like Jake Marley's face. Oh, now, come on, Abe, old boy. You've got to get hold of yourself. This is ridiculous. And I haven't touched a drop in weeks. He got up and walked around the room a few times... Then went back and sat on again. He stretched, rested his head on the back of the chair. From somewhere, a bell started chiming, and Scrooge sat straight up in his chair. He heard something else, too. Something from downstairs. What the... Oh, now, what is that? What's going on? Who's that? Come on, who's out there? Then all of a sudden, it came right through the wall. Marley! Jake Marley! Oh, no, no! I got to stop eating lobster. Oh, it couldn't be. Hey, what's with you? Who are you? Jake Marley. Who else? You're dead. The deadest. But nevertheless, Jake Marley. His ghost. You are very sharp today, Scrooge, old boy. I don't believe it. You got eyes, ain't you? Yeah, and I got a bad stomach, too. That's who you are. Nothing but a bad case of indigestion. You don't think I'm a ghost, huh? Okay, maybe a good scare will change your mind. Whoa. Oh, no, 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 no. Stay away from me, I believe you. Sold on the idea? Yeah, yeah, but why do you got to come to see me? Regulation. Every man is supposed to live his life and help his buddies. If he don't do it while he's alive, then he's got to do it after he kicks off. Oh. Now, stop that. Hey, what's with all those chains and things you got wrapped around you? Oh, these... Well, this here chain is like my life. Each one of these links is something I did wrong. But why do you have to hold it around with you? Why don't you check it someplace? Screw Joe boy. When we was in business together, I never took time out to do any good. I just kept making a buck and figured that was enough. Well, now I got to pay for it. I got to haul this chain around and try to make up for all the things I didn't do when I was alive. But why come to me? Because you're going to end up just like me, unless we do something in a hurry. Now, I haven't got much time, so you better listen. Oh, I don't want to be like you. I'll listen. Okay. You're going to have three visitors. You're going to be haunted by three spirits. Oh, no. It's the only way you can keep from being like me. When you hear that bell strike one, the first one will be here. Well, I got to be going. You won't see me again, but you remember what I told you. So long, Scrooge, old boy. Your goosebumps can relax now. After the ghost took off, Scrooge just refused to believe it. Ah, nuts. It's ridiculous. Humbug. Then he climbed into the sack and was soon snoring up a storm. <laughs> When Scrooge awoke, it was still dark, and the bell from the church on 53rd Street was striking 12. 
He laid awake listening and thinking to himself. Oh, just a dream. Ghosts. Bah. Finally, he dropped off again and slept for about an hour. Then the big bell struck one. One o'clock and I don't see no ghost. I knew it was something I ate. All of a sudden, a big light flashed in the room. The first of the spirits stood before him. Oh, Jake was right. Are you the first spirit that Jake said would come to haunt me? Yeah, you know it. Well, who are you? Me? I'm the ghost of Christmas past. Yeah? How long past? Your past. Come on, we're going to take a walk. Oh, where are we going? Just relax. I'm running this tour. Oh, we'll let me get my pants. Uh, you got them. Hey, they're on me. With that, the ghost of Christmas past grabbed Scrooge by the hand and they both flew out of the window. Scrooge nearly lost his upper plate. But before he could yell for help, he was standing in front of a dirty, ramshackle old tenement building. You uh, know where you are? Sure, I know where I am. This is where I was brought up. Even the garbage cans are the same. You had a pretty tough time when you were a kid, didn't you? The toughest. I wasn't very big and the rest of the kids in the neighborhood were. I had more black eyes than a crow. You want to go in? What for? To see your folks. My folks died a long time ago. They're in there now. Come on. Well, the ghost took old Scrooge into the building and showed him a Christmas years past when he was a child with his family. Sure, it was tough living in two little rooms like that, but Scrooge remembered how wonderful it really was. <laughs> What's the matter, Scrooge? Huh? Oh, I got something in my eye. You were pretty lonely when your folks... Uh, when they... Yeah. You know, there was a young kid that came around earlier this evening and sang some carols. I wish... Yeah, uh, what do you wish? Oh, nothing. Come on. I want to show you another Christmas. The spirit showed him another Christmas and still another. And you know, no matter how tough Scrooge remembered his childhood had been, it always seemed that Christmas was wonderful. Then the spirit took him to a building down to the river where Scrooge got his first job. He went inside and seated behind a desk, Scrooge spotted Fezziwig. Well, I'll be darned. It's old Fezziwig alive again. And there's Dick Wilkins. He was a good boy. We got along great. He liked me. Okay, everybody, it's Christmas Eve. You can knock off and have yourself a good time. You better lock up, Dick. Sure, right away, Mr. Fezziwig. And don't look so unhappy, Ebenezer. It's Christmas. Come on home with me and tear into a big turkey. All locked up, Dick? Yes, sir. Ready, Ebenezer? Yes, sir. Okay, let's go and have Merry Christmas, you two. Yeah. Merry Christmas, Merry Mr. Christmas, Fezziwig. Mr. Fezziwig. Merry Christmas. Then the spirit took Scrooge over to Fezziwig's house and they saw the wonderful party that Mrs. Fez Fezziwig had gotten together. Scrooge watched and remembered and the spirit said, Wasn't Fezziwig a stupid, sentimental old goat? Oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you something. He was a great guy, he was. You know... What, Scrooge? I was just thinking about Bob Cratchit, who works for me. I think I'd like to do something for him. You know he's got a wife and four kids... Is that right? Yeah, four kids. Come on, I've seen enough. Okay, but you've got to see these things if you want to get squared away. And believe me, brother, you need squaring away. Let's go home, Scrooge. Before he knew it, Scrooge was back in his little room and the spirit was gone. Scrooge was pretty beat and he climbed into bed and dropped into a heavy sleep. <laughs> What's that? It's two o'clock. Hey, that light in the other room. I got burglars. Hey, Scrooge. Scrooge, come on in. Who's that? What are you doing in the other room? Come on in. Take a look. It's pretty nifty. Hey, what is this? What have you done to the room? It looks like Macy's window. Where'd you get all the holly and the mistletoe? And how'd you get it in here? You like it? Oh, for Pete's sake, a Christmas tree. Who are you? The ghost of Christmas present. 
Now, don't tell me you don't like the way I fix things up. I work pretty hard. Oh, the second ghost. Okay, take me wherever you want to go, but believe me, the next time I try the train. Come on, let's go. Now, what do you see? Oh, I see bright colored lights. People having a lot of fun. Kids on sleighs. See that building over there? The one with the big wreath on the front door? I got 2020. That's where Bob Cratchit lives. He works for me. Hey, look. There's Bob now. Yes, going into the house. Up all those stairs to the fifth floor. And he's got his little boy on his back. Tiny Tim. Yeah. Got polio last summer. Pretty sick little boy. I know. Bob said he'd need a lot of care if he was ever going to walk again. Let's take a peek. Hi. Hello, honey. You and Tim have a good time? Best. Didn't we, Tim? Yeah, Dad. We watched all the kids on the block on their sleds. Mom, will I ever be able to ride a sled? Of course, Tim. Won't he, dear? Sure thing, Roughneck. Next Christmas, you'll be out there doing belly whoppers with the rest of them. Dad, what's the matter? Your eyes are all wet. <laughs> Nothing, Tim. I just got some snow in them. Want some dinner, Tim? Oh, Mom, stew for Christmas. I'm sorry, Tim. Oh, that's okay, Mom. I like stew. Bob, will you please say grace? Can I say something first, Mom? Of course, Tim. What would you like to say? God bless us. Everyone. What's the matter, Scrooge, old boy? Got some snow in your eyes, too? Tell me something. Well, sure, if I can. What about Tiny Tim? Oh, can't say for sure. But if his old man makes enough money next year to get the right doctors, little Tim will get along just fine, but... Times are tough, aren't they, Scrooge? Yeah. Now the spirit of Christmas present took Scrooge to many places and showed him a lot of happiness and a lot of misery. And finally, back to his little room, and the spirit was gone. Oh, I don't know whether I can take much more of this. And the new ghost drifted in. This was the worst yet. He was really done up for haunting. He was all dressed in black with one arm sticking out and pointing right at poor old Scrooge. This was the last one of the spirits. Scrooge's knees sounded like castanets on a reducing machine. Okay, okay, you don't have to tell me. You're the ghost of the Christmas that hasn't come yet. You I'm really scared of. The ghost took off of Scrooge right after him. The city disappeared and Scrooge found himself in the outskirts of town standing in the graveyard. The night was howling like it was mad. And as Scrooge looked down, he saw... Hey, what's this? What's this stone? The black spirit stood still and pointed, so Scrooge leaned down and pulled away the bushes and saw it was a tombstone. Well, there's a name here. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, no, no. Look, not this. Believe me, I don't want this. I know I've done wrong, but I'm not kidding. I really know what Christmas means. It doesn't mean just today or tomorrow. It's every day, every day of your life. I swear I'll do better. Only take me away from this. Let me try. Let me try to make Christmas right for me and everybody else. Please don't let this happen. Give me another chance. Well, don't just stand there. Put your arm back and you'll catch cold. Well, say something. <laughs> Suddenly, Scrooge dropped to his knees and reached out for the spirit. But something happened. The spirit started to shrink. Then it collapsed. And when Scrooge looked up... What the... Uh, my bedpost. My own bedpost. I'm home. Oh, thank goodness. I lived the past and the present and the future, and now I'm home. Hallelujah! Spirits, wherever you are, believe me. From now on, things are going to be different. Oh, yeah. And... Thanks. Paper! Mine and paper! Hey, boy! Yeah? What day is this? It's Christmas! What's with you? Christmas? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, I haven't missed it. The spooks did it all in one night. Boy! Yeah? Oh, it's you, Mr. Scrooge. How many papers have you got? I don't know. Why? Well, 
Here's five bucks. Throw them away and go have yourself a Merry Christmas. Gee, thanks, Mr. Scrooge. And a Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, boy, say that again. Thanks? No, 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 the other. You mean Merry Christmas? Yeah, that's it. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm coming. What's the matter with you? Can't you see the store's closed? Look, mister, this is... Eb. Ebenezer Scrooge. Merry Christmas, Barney. Huh? Hey, you been drinking? Not a drop. Well, what's the matter with you? Ain't you gonna wish me a Merry Christmas? Wish? Oh, oh sh- sure, sure. Come on in. Uh, wife's upstairs with her mother, but I got a bottle in the back. I... I think maybe you better have some, something strong. Uh, look, your grocery store's closed, but you could still sell me a turkey, couldn't you? Well, I don't know. Well, you got a couple, they'll just go to waste. Well, what do you want a turkey for? You've been eating at the automat every Christmas for the last seven years. Oh, it's not for me. But nevertheless, I have been invited to my nephew Fred's house for a Christmas dinner. Well, then who's the bird for? Bob Cratchit. You know, the young guy that works for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. How much you gonna charge him? Here's 20 bucks. That ought to be enough for the bird. No, no, no. It ain't worth that much. You sure you ain't been into something? Well, if it's too much, give the rest to your kid and have him deliver the turkey to Cratchit's house. Here's the address, and don't tell Cratchit who sent the thing, okay? Okay. Merry Christmas, Barney. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Well, old Scrooge went back to his rooms and took, an out, took out an old blue suit out of the mothball. He shook it out, put a few creases in it, and went out into the street. The old boy was really with it. Everybody he passed, he greeted them with, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Eh? Oh, oh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Scrooge went to church and gave a large donation, and Father McCarthy nearly forgot his sermon. And then Scrooge went out on the street again and down into the Bowery. God bless you, sir, and a Merry Christmas. Isn't it, though? He kept walking and having a great time. Later that afternoon, he arrived at his nephew's house. Well, what the... Merry Christmas, Fred. I've come to dinner. Oh, my gosh. Here, I brought you some presents. Oh, my gosh. Now, don't thank me. It's Christmas, remember? Oh, my gosh! Next morning, Scrooge was early at the office. If he could just catch Cratchit coming in late. And he did. Bob was a good 21 minutes late. Cratchit? Oh, no. You're 21 minutes late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Scrooge. I had a big evening last night. You did, huh? You know what I told you if I caught you fancy footing it in here late again. Okay, so I'm canned. You think you got it coming? Oh, I'm too tired to argue, Mr. Scrooge. Jobs are tough enough, and I hate to lose this one, but I'm just too tired. A raise would help, huh? That's the silliest question of the year. Then you got it. It's in that envelope. What? what? Yeah, and maybe after we see how the funds are, we can do something about Tiny Tim. I I don't get it. A raise? You want to do something about Tim? I don't get it. Sure you do, Bob. Haven't you heard? It's Christmas. Now, go on home, take the day off. Yeah. Take the week off. Oh. Come back when you feel like it. Merry Christmas. Uh, Mr. Scrooge? Yeah? Merry Christmas. And Scrooge really did it. He was as good as his word, better even. He made it the merriest Christmas ever. And later, things got better, and he took care of Tiny Tim. And sure enough, Tim was out on his sled the next Christmas, doing belly whoppers with the best of them. Every Christmas thereafter, all along the big street, it was said, if anyone knew how to make Christmas merry, old Ebenezer Scrooge was that one. And I hope that can really be said about all of us, just like Tiny Tim said. God bless us, everyone. That's right, Tim. God bless us, everyone. Merry Christmas, God bless everyone. Oh, Rick. Yes, Helen? That was wonderful. Not quite the way Dickens wrote it, but it meant the same thing. Oh, you really like it, baby? Oh, I loved it. No reason in the world why old Scrooge couldn't have been living right here today. You've got the spirit, and that's what counts. 
How did you like it, Walt? Rick, I got to hand it to you. It was really great. Uh, Lieutenant. Yeah, what is it, Otis? Uh, how'd I do in the play? You were magnificent, Sergeant. Y- you know, I bet if I studied for a couple of weeks, I'd get me a part on Broadway. To be or not to be? That's the question. Oh, no. Now, Walt, leave him alone. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, Monsieur Otis. Huh? Wouldst thou accompany me over to the punch bowl for a short flagon of nectar? Sure, I would. See you later, Helen, Rick. Yeah. Come on, Barrymore. Let's see if the punch bowl fits your head. <laughs> oh, aren't they lovely? You want something to eat? Uh, hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Listen. They're out here by this window. Come on, let's go listen. Sure was. Rick, sing something with them. Oh, no, honey. I don't want to loss up the end. Please, oh, Rick. Come on. Come on. All right, all right. I, I tell you what I'll do. Everybody usually sings Christmas songs about snow. I'm going to sing one about sunshine. It's called Melikalikimaka. Melikalikimaka? Well, it means Merry Christmas in Hawaiian. In Hawaiian? Sure. It's a brand new song. They love it over there, and we'll love it here. Meili Kaliki Maka is the thing to say, and Haoli Maka Hiho. That's our Christmas greeting in a Vahine, and a Happy New Year, too. With the hope that Christmas may be green and bright The sun to shine by day and all the stars that night Meli Kaliki Maka is a wise way To say Merry Christmas to you Christmas to everybody. Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, radio station WBRE today is celebrating its silver anniversary of serving the people of the coal country with better programming. From all of us in Hollywood, congratulations to NBC affiliate WBRE on 25 years of broadcasting and best wishes for another 25. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective, will return to the air at a new day and time, Sunday, January 15th. Till then, this is Eddie King relaying our best wishes for the holiday season. Now here, Home for Christmas and Hop Along Cassidy on NBC.
Portions of the following program are transcribed. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Is uh, this the Diamond Detective Agency? Well, what does the sign on the door say? Yeah, uh, Diamond Detective Agency. And take a guess. Uh, are you Mr. Richard Diamond? It depends. How much does he owe you? Uh, uh, nothing. You just want to speak to him? I do. You come as a client? Yes, I do. You have a hundred a day in expenses? Yeah, I do. Then I now pronounce this man and client. Your name, please? Uh, my, my name is Thomas Jason. The stockbroker? Well, you better pay cash. Oh, I, I'm retired now, Mr. Diamond. And to end this uh, nonsense, here's your hundred dollars. Oh, thank you. Now, what's your trouble? Uh, it's Carol, uh, my adopted daughter. We adopted her when she was 12, but my wife died shortly after. Frankly, Carol has been trouble ever since. And now? Uh, now, I, I'm afraid it is no longer a matter of delinquency. I... Uh, yeah. Well, there have been several incidents that make me suspect that she's trying to do away with me. Oh, sweet girl. What's her reason? In my money. In my will, she is my only heir. Why not change the will? I, I said I suspected her, but I'm not certain, Mr. Diamond. And you understand, it would be terrible to disinherit her if I am wrong about my suspicions. I, I, I simply must be sure before I change my will. Do you have any idea of your suspicion? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. This morning I did speak to her. They mentioned the possibility of cutting her from my will. She flew into a rage, made several terrible threats. Oh, what do you want me to do? Well, sir, I want you to... Oh, excuse me. Diamond Detective Agency, we have the only corpse with the lie-down design. Oh, Rick. Why don't you answer the phone right? Okay, Helen, baby. Diamond Detective Agency, Mr. Richard Diamond speaking. What? See, it throws you. Uh, uh, Mr. Diamond. Uh, honey, I'll see you tonight. I got a client. She? He. Good. Bye. Uh, you were saying, Mr. Jason, before I was so nicely interrupted. Yes, I, I want you to either prove my fears to be true or groundless. If I am right, I will change my will, of course. Where do I start? Uh, come to my house at three this afternoon. Here's the address. I'll introduce you to my stepdaughter, Carol, as a business acquaintance. After you've met and talked with her, I'll give you what details I have about her threats and actions. Okay, Mr. Jason, I'll be at your place at three this afternoon. Good day, Mr. Diamond. I checked the time and found it would be nearly twelve, so I beat it out to grab a bite of food before the noon rush began. Cafes in downtown Manhattan at lunchtime can only be compared to a can of sardines after all their relatives move in. When I had down my daily bread, I went back to the office, did a little washing, and found myself with still time to kill. So being interested in my new client's problems and always liking a clear view of a new case, I dropped in at the 5th Precinct to see what Lieutenant Levison had on the Jason family. When I walked into the squad room, I found Sergeant Otis tilted back in his chair with his number 14s crossed on the desk in front of him. From the sounds he was making, he was either sleeping or gargling with molasses. Sergeant Otis. Oh, boy. Sergeant Otis. <laughs> Some down. Otis, wake up. Oh, what? Oh. Oh. Oh, it's you, Salmons. Patrol leader Diamond with his stout hearted brownies, who are shocked by your dreams. Shame on you. Hey. How'd you know I was dreaming about a dame? I peeked. You know, I think I'll tell the lieutenant that you were sleeping on the job. Well, oh, oh, no, please don't do that, Shamus. You start me pounding the beat again. Please don't tell him. Well, maybe I'll let you off the hook, but only if you tell Walt we're pals. That might stop him from giving me the devil about ribbing you. Pals? You mean friends? Buddies. Oh, no, I couldn't stand it. Hello, Walt. Okay, so where's the body? Nobody. You lost one? Now you stop that. Well, get you. All bad because I can't find a body for you. Oh, please, Rick. What do you want? I just wanted any dope you might have on the Thomas Jason family. Jason? Yeah, the broker. Oh, oh nothing on him, but plenty on his stepdaughter, Carol. Like what? Well, she's a regular. Usually D&D, &D, drunk driving, disturbing the peace. You want to see the file? Yeah, it might be worth a look. Uh, 
have my pal Otis bring it in. Sure, up. I... Your what? My pal. What did you know? Otis and I are friends. <laughs> Is that why he tries to hide under the desk every time he sees you coming? Call him in. See for yourself. You think I won't? Otis, get the file on Carol Jason. Bring it in here. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. <laughs> now we'll see. Friend, <laughs> that's a laugh. <laughs> it's a laugh yourself. You better be feeling good. Yeah, what do you mean by that? You'll see. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant, here's the file. I'll take it, Otis. Thank you very much. Sergeant Otis, you have an opportunity to do me a great favor. Please, and without profanity, tell me what you think of Rick. Oh, he's nice. What? You're turning blue, Walt. I'll turn blue if I want to. What did you do to Otis? Dope him? You heard him. He thinks I'm nice. We're pals, buddies. I heard him all right, but I wouldn't believe it on the stack of police manuals. Otis, I'll give you one chance. What's this all about? The shamus told you, Lieutenant. I think he's a swell egg. A great guy. Thank you, Otis, my uh, friend. Always kidding, but a good pal. Otis, do your feet ache? My feet? Why, no, Lieutenant. Well, they will. I'm sending you to a beat. A beat? Yes, in Yonkers. Oh, no! I went through the file on Carol Jason and found out Walt hadn't been kidding. She'd been picked up for everything from kicking dogs to slugging her boyfriend with a champagne bottle. Real nice girl. I left Walt trying to third degree the truth out of Otis and headed for what I hoped would be a nice easy case. In a few minutes, I was in front of my client, Jason's house on East 66th Street. It turned out to be a modest little shack of some 30 rooms with a brownstone cover. I was ushered in to wait in the library for Thomas Jason. But I got a surprise. Mr. Diamond? Well... Now, I'll bet you're Carol. Your stepfather's told me so much about you. You're a friend of my stepfather's? Well, uh, you might say we have things in common. Where is he? I'm afraid you can't see him, Mr. Diamond. You see, he's become quite ill. Oh, ill so quickly? I talked to him a few hours ago. He's about as sickly as Paul Bunyan. Mr. Diamond, will you please leave? Not until you tell me what happened to Jason, where he is, and why I can't see him. Get out. Do you hear me? Get out. Oh, put a cork in it, honey. Your father suspected trouble. Apparently, it came quicker than he thought. Me, I want to know all your little secrets. Just who are you? Policeman? Private policeman, dear. Your father hired me this morning. Well, I'm firing you this afternoon. Father's ill, and I will not allow him to be disturbed. He paid me for a day's work. Tomorrow you can fire me. Is he here? No. Now, will you get out or do I call the real police? Oh, maybe you'd better, dear. There's a smell around here that isn't a room full of roses. All right. If it's going to save trouble, I will tell you this much. Father had a serious mental condition. This afternoon, a couple of hours ago, he had an attack. And I was forced to have him taken to a place where he could be treated properly. With what? Embalming fluid? Why, you insulting... Where was he taken? Who's the doctor? I think I've answered all the questions I need to, Mr. Diamond. My actions are entirely legal. If you persist in your insinuations, I shall see that your license is revoked and that you are charged with defamation of character. Oh, get you. You've been reading up on the law, and I'll bet I know why. All right, dear. I'll leave now. Go on, and don't come back. Temper, temper, temper. I'm going, but we'll see each other again. Uh, hello, Pop. Got a minute? Yeah. You reckon so, Misty? What's on your mind? Oh, questions. Like how long you've been out here mowing the lawn? Uh, most of the day. Why? Did you uh, see Mr. Jason leave? Oh, sure. Left in an ambulance, he did. He was wearing a funny white coat with the arms tied in back. Oh, my fashion certainly changed. You didn't notice any name on the ambulance, did you? Well, as a matter of fact, I did, mister. Oh, my, it was a silly name. About the silliest I've ever heard of. Oh, the a... name, Pop. What was it? Oh, don't be in such a dang rush. It was uh, home, sweet home, rest home. <laughs> Ain't that silly? I don't think my client agrees with you. If he was taken there for a rest, it may be a permanent one. Next stop, a drugstore with a phone book. Said book gave me the address, and I was soon in Baychester, looking at something pretty swank in the way of nut houses. Home, sweet home was two acres of lawn, trees, and a square white blockhouse and all surrounded by 15 feet of spiked steel fencing. By this time, the setup was really beginning to smell, and I decided that maybe a shamus might not be welcome. So for a moment, I stood by the big gate debating how I could get in. The answer was fairly simple. I rang the bell. It caused a huge character wearing a white jacket with arms like hairy telephone poles to appear. 
Yeah? What can I do for you, mister? Now, let me in. Why? This is a rest home, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I want to rest. Oh, funny. Beat it. I want to speak to the doctor, King Kong. Is he in? Maybe, maybe not. Who wants him? I do. Who are you? Ah, let's just say I'm a patient. You going to keep me out here dying of schizophrenia? Dr. Thorne is busy now. Come back later. Look, in one minute I start throwing fits. Think how that'll ruin your trade. Yeah, the doc wouldn't like that. Maybe you had better come in. Now, that's right neighborly of you, friend. Wow. Nice place. For nuts? Please. I'm a patient, remember? So, if you're a nut, I should care. If you ain't, why should you? Now, that's a homely bit of philosophy. Tell me, what do you do here? Break skulls? I don't think I like you. And I'm a nurse. What a shock this will be to Dr. Kildare. I don't know him. Now, you wouldn't. His nurses are pretty. If he had to have you as a nurse, he'd quit medicine and take up playing the glockenspiel. Well, you're nuts. Wait here. I'll get the doctor. Yes, nurse. Dr. Thorne, you got a patient, I think. All right, Brasso. I am Dr. Thorne, sir. What can I do for you? He's nuts, Doc. Be quiet, Brasso. Oh, he's right, Doc. I, I'm nuttier than a squirrel's hideout. Well, I'm afraid I can be of no assistance, uh, Mr. Promise you won't tell? Did I promise? I am Sherlock Holmes. What? H O L. I can spell. I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place, Mr. Holmes. This is a private sanitarium, and certain procedures must be followed. I have money, I can pay, and I want to stay here. But, Mr. Holmes, you must be examined by a doctor and committed by a relative. You're a doctor? Examine me. But your relative, you, you can't commit yourself. Why not? I demand my rights. Oh, this is preposterous. This is not a hotel. You can't just come in and register. Tell me, you know, who's your doctor? Where is your home? Well, look, look. Tell you what, you let me stay here for the day and I'll tell you who my doctor is. And if you don't let me stay, I'll tell everyone what a bad place you have. Uh, you, uh, you said something about having um, money. Just how much money? I've got a mattress full. Can I stay? Well, perhaps it can be arranged. Though, of course, I must examine you. Of course. And there will be a certain um, fee, you understand? Mm, I'm beginning to. Tell me, Mr. Um, H -O -L. Uh, stop. Mm, you certainly are most annoying. Tell me, why do you want to stay here anyway? Well, I, I've got to stop the plot. The, the plot? You know about that? Sure. You plan to rub out fearless Fosdick, but I'm not going to let you. Oh, I see. Tell me, do you, uh, do you have any dreams? Well, of course. I have dreams about eating ice cream cones, and oh, what a mess they are. What's so messy about eating an ice cream cone? My mouth is always filled with BBs. BBs? For my air rifle, stupid. How else could I stand off the Indians? Well, what Indians? Well, the Indians who want to steal my ice cream cones. Now, why would Indians want your ice cream cones? Oh, they're mad about pistachio. You are crazy, aren't you? Brazo, take Mr... Um... H-O-L. Oh, never mind. Take him to observation room B, Brazo. I don't have time for... The examination now. Uh, wait, uh, can't I be with the other patients? I get lonely. Later, later. Come on, Sherlock. This way. Well, I was in, thanks to the good doctor not being able to pass up a possible easy buck. The big ape Brazo led me to a small room with bars on the window and a spring lock on the door. When he left, I made like a smart gum shoe and went after the lock with my penknife. Due to my early training in picking locks at the automat, I was out like Alabama. I found myself in a long hall with seven rooms, three on each side and one at the end. I knocked on every door. Nothing. Not even Bogart. The last one had to be Jason. Are you in there, Mr. Jason? Diamond. Oh, oh I am glad to hear your voice. Please, get, get me out of here. Uh, just take it easy. I don't have a key, and this door has a padlock on it. But you must get me out. Sure, sure, but give me time. First, tell me what's the score. Why did they lock you up? Carol had it planned. She has paid Dr. Thorne to keep me here until I go crazy. She wants to have me judged legally insane so she can take the estate. Yeah, well, maybe I can put a few kinks in her plan. Wait, wait Diamond, where are you going? Uh, there's a phone in the doctor's office. 
If no one's there, I'll use it to get help. Yes, but what if you can't get to the phone? And I go out and get the Marines. If I can get by that ape man, that locked gate. Don't go away. Oh, there you are, Sherlock. Oh, don't pick on me. I was only three and a half years old. Yeah, I'm upset with you, Sherlock. You oughtn't to be running around the halls like this. Well, you know? That guy's got to have his constitutional, Brazo. Yeah, well, you're true with yours. The doc wants to examine you now. I've, I've, I've changed my mind. I, I don't think I'd I like it I said the doc wants you what the doc wants he gets. Well, bully for him, but this is one time you won't. I'm leaving. I don't want to break your arm, Sherlock. Sherlock. No? So you don't leave until the doc says so. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint him, but certain things are necessary, like this. <clears throat> oh. Now, you shouldn't act like oh. that. I might get mad. Oh, my knuckles. What is your jaw made of, concrete? Uh, come on, Sherlock. Or do you want to try again? Uh, no, thanks. One busted hand is enough. And don't try to run. The gate's locked. And if I have to catch you, <laughs> I'll fix your leg so you can't run again. Oh, friendly little butcher, aren't you? Uh, right in here, Sherlock. The doc is waiting. <laughs> here he is, Doc. Good. <clears throat> you can go back to the office, Brazo. I won't need you. Where? You seem to be well-trained as a detective, Mr. Holmes. Do you always pick locks so easily? I do better with my erector set. Uh, but you needn't examine me further. I've changed my mind. You've changed your... This is on. First you demand in, now you want out. I just remembered I forgot to pick up my station wagon. But the Indians, you want me to help you keep them from stealing your ice cream cones, don't you? Uh, they already got them, and all my money, too. They're both gone. Your money? And you don't have any money? Not a bolivar. Now, may I go, Doctor? You're going to stay right here, Mr. Holmes. There's something peculiar about the way you've recovered from your illusions. Doc, uh, Miss Jason to see you. She's in your office. Very well, Brazo. Stay here and guard this man, whoever he is. Uh, Holmes, H O. Will you shut up? I make sure he stays put this time, Brazo. I have some questions I want to ask him. He won't go in the place, Doc. You go ahead to the office. Well, Carol... This is a pleasant surprise. Come to visit Jason. So, and our plans will have to be changed. Changed? Something has come up that may cause an investigation of stepfather's illness. We can't afford to take a chance of that. But we can't let Jason go now. I had no such intentions. He must be taken care of tonight. Taken care of? But that's impossible. How could he I... He must be gotten rid of. What? Oh, no. No, I didn't bargain for murder. Look, Thorne, you're in and you stay in. I've paid you $10,000. Don't forget it. But why all this sudden rush to change our plan? Why can't we A private it? detective came to see me this morning. He was hired by stepfather. I knew he had suspicions, but I didn't know they'd gone so far. A detective? Oh, he can't act legally, but he's a sort to cause trouble. Detective. Private detective. Sherlock Holmes. He's rambling about. I'm afraid we're in serious trouble. Come with me. What? Your private detective. I think he's already found Jason. Come on. You wouldn't like to earn a hundred bucks, would you, Brazo? No. It is you, Diamond. Uh oh, fun's over. Thorne, you fool. How'd he get in here? He said he was a patient, Carol, and I swear he seemed crazy enough. He probably said he had money. Uh, you seem to understand each other, honey, but do you mind? I'd like to take Mr. Jason home. For now. a couple of extra dollars, you let him walk right in. Oh, Thorne, you're an idiot. I suppose he's found Jason and talked to him. Well, he did get out of his room and wander about. Oh, that's great. So now I know the whole works. Uh, too bad, baby. Your plan is kaput. No, it's Quite, Diamond. You've just talked yourself into real trouble. This gun says for you not to get any bright ideas. My IQ just dropped 30 points. Shut him up, Rizzo. Sure. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh! Now, stay with him while Thorne and I make arrangements. We won't be long. <laughs> Do I get the... Yes, Rizzo, when we're ready. Come on, Thorne, I want to talk to Stepfather. <laughs> Brazo's fist was made of the same stuff as his jaw. By the time I came around, darkness had painted the window, and the room was full of shadow and Brazo. The big hulk was squatting a few feet away, paying no attention to me. So I waited till my mind was clear while I eased off my right shoe. The heel was leather with a steel plate in it. I could only hope it was harder than Brazo's skull. With the shoe in my hand behind me, I was ready. Only to have him catch me stirring. <laughs> Coming to, eh, Shamus? Yeah, oh, yeah. H hand me my cigarettes, will you, Brazo? You need a smoke, eh? Oh. <laughs> sure. So where, where are they? Uh, fell out of my pocket, uh, over there behind you. Oh, where, where? I don't see you. <laughs> I say, that's not... Need another? <laughs> Stop that. Oh, come on, Buster, fall. <laughs> well, is little old Brazo finally getting sleepy? 
Happy New Year, buster. Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick, if you don't want me to be a customer of yours, get out to the home sweet home rest home fast. What? Hey, what kind of a gag is this now? It's no gag, believe me. My client and I are the blue plate specials and dinner is about to be served. The home sweet... Oh, it still sounds like a gag. Who'd call anything that? Now, don't argue, Walt. It's no joke. Okay, Rick. What's the address? 1820 Allerton Avenue, Baychester. And bring a blowtorch to cut an iron gauge. You may have to. All right. I'll be there in 30 minutes. Uh, quicker, if you can. Stand right there, Diamond. Or I'll use this gun. Uh, good afternoon. I represent the sleep tight... Like I came just in time. Only now that you've fixed Brazo, you have to dig your own grave. Dig my own grave? Oh, honey, is this trip really necessary? Keep moving or I'll kill you right here. I, I move. Keep going. Over there behind those trees where Thorne and Jason are. Well, is Jason... He's alive, but not for long. Where's Roswell? I thought he was going to... Diamond knocked him out. We can dig their own graves. There are the shovels. Get busy. Carol, please, you may have the money. I swear... Shut up and dig. Carol, this is... Just ab- work the shovel. Can you imagine Richard Diamond, private detective, letting a sawed-off female make him dig his own grave? You can't? Well, she did. And for a good half hour. I stalled as long as I could to give Walt Levinson the chance to get there. That's enough. I said that's deep enough. Oh, please. I, I'm just started. You're finished. Jason, get into that hole with him. Uh, very well. I, I guess this is it, Diamond. I'm sorry to have dragged you in. Well, that's a horrible way to say it. Don't we get time for a last cigarette? No. Thorne, take this gun. What? Oh, no, I'm not going to kill them. Shut up and take this gun. Oh, don't do it, Thorne. Be a man about it. Here, Thorne. Don't be such a weakling. Two shots and it's over. No, it was your idea. I'm no murderer. That a boy. Stick up for your rights. You shut up. Thorne, do you do the job or do I make you number three in that grave? You wouldn't dare. You, you need me. Shut up, boy, Thorne. Tell her. Go on, Thorne. Take the gun. No, I can't. I just can't. Not my face. You whistling. I'll do it myself. Now, turn around, Diamond. Oh, now, look, baby. This thing's getting out of hand. You shoot me and the law will be all over the place. Not until I've filled that grave in over you. I called him, baby. Oh, you're lying. Am I? Well, just turn around and take a look at that lovely big fat policeman standing over there by that tree. Oh, you really don't expect me to fall for an old stunt like that. Well, if you don't, you'll fall for something. It's your funeral. No, it isn't. It's yours. All right, lady, drop it. What? Why are you... Smarty. I'll kill you anyway. <laughs> Carol. Rick, Rick, what the devil's going on here? What are you doing down there? I'm looking at the girl. I, I think you shot her pretty bad. Who are these two guys? Well, the guy with the cast in that knees is Doc Thorne. Better put the cuffs on him as an accessory. But you can't do this. I was the one that re- refused to shoot you. Oh, stop licking my hand. You can tell it to the precinct judge. Otis, snap the cuffs on them and take him out the car. Sure. Come on, you. Now, what about this other guy? The girl's stepfather. How do you feel, Mr. Jason? Sick, Mr. Diamond. How about the girl, Rick? Shall I call the ambulance? I don't know. Carol. Carol. Well, Rick? Uh, take your time, Walt. She's not with us. I gave Walt the story, then took Jason to his house. Stayed there long enough to brush the dirt off my clothes, wash my hands, and then I headed for a delayed date. At 975 Park Avenue, I found a big fireplace and a lovely redhead waiting for me. A redhead wearing a dress that was part green silk and part... Well... I'm the library, darling. Come on in. Uh, hello, Helen, baby. You sound like you found oil in the basement. What's with the cheer? Me? Isn't it always? I like you. Hmm, I like the way you say that. Looking up at me with those big green eyes. They're not green. They're hazel. Oh, are they? Hmm... Let me look closer. Uh, not until you sing for me. Sing? Oh, honey, I'm tired. I want to rest. No, you don't. No, over to the piano. No, Rick, not here. But, Helen, all I wanted to do was... I know, Rick. Oh, you've been using that Ouija board again. I don't want to sing. Now look in my eyes. Close range? Contact. I'll sing. That's better. 
Like, uh, you must have been a beautiful baby. I love it. You must have been a beautiful baby. You must have been a wonderful child. When you were only starting to go to kindergarten, I bet you drove the little boys wild. And when it came to winning blue ribbons, you must have shown the other kids how. I can see the judges' eyes as they handed you the prize. I bet you made the cutest bow. Oh, you must have been a beautiful baby. Cause, baby, look at you now. Like that? That was wonderful, Rick. Come here. Hmm. About time. Mm. Oh, Rick. Do you think you can do that and sing, too? Honey, when you look at me like that, I could kiss you, sing, and knit a whole sweater at the same time. Rick, could you? Want to try? A sweater will take years. I'll buy that. Come here, we'll start with the neck. Rick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know something? Mm -hmm. What? I may even knit you a whole suit. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Averback, Betty Moran, Howard McNear, Edwin Max, and Jay Novello. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. How much is your life worth? Think about that for a minute. Is it worth a little care? Well, that's all that's needed to protect it on America's streets and highways. Only your careful driving and your acceptance of personal responsibility for your own life can guard you from the dangers of the road. The price that you may pay for carelessness is a high one, and it's a price that thousands upon thousands of accident victims have already paid. Their gamble with death behind the wheel is a stark warning, a warning that an accident can happen to you. Last year alone, some 32,000 persons were killed in traffic accidents, and well over a million others were injured. Smash-ups have averaged more than one a minute, every minute of the day and night. These are the facts of traffic dangers. As for the facts of traffic safety, well, they all boil down to just two facts. Careful driving by automobile owners, careful walking by pedestrians. So drive carefully, walk carefully. The care you take may save a life, and that life may be your own. Saturday night is packed with entertainment when you stay tuned to NBC's star lineup of shows. Each Saturday, make it a point to listen to NBC. You'll hear Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, Grand Old Opry, and Songs by Morton Downey. Now, stay tuned for Lionel Barrymore and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Portions of the following program are transcribed. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Yeah.
Yep, door's open. Mr. Diamond. Well, Angelino, come in. I didn't know whether you were busy or not. If you didn't hear the drums, you'd know I'm not busy. Drums, Mr. Diamond? Well, it's a sort of a ritual, Angie. Every time I get a paying client, my landlord offers up his thanks to the goddess of joy. Plays an old bongo and turns on the heat as a kind of sacrifice. I see. Oh, no, no, you don't. You're too normal. What's the trouble, Angelino? The pig's knuckles in your butcher shop got arthritis? <laughs> you always with the kidding, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, that's the kind of a hairpin I am. Hairpin? Uh, Angie, you got something on your mind. Forget my little asides and let's have it. Uh, I got the big problem, Mr. Diamond. Oh, you mean something's wrong and you can't pay me to take care of it? Oh, no, no, I can pay. Oh, well, then you haven't got a problem. You slip me the cash and I'll move in on your worries. Well, you see, it's like this. I come to you as a sort of representative for all the other butcher shops, the independent ones. I ain't the only one that's worried. So all the butchers got together last night and decided to do something about it. I, uh, I hate to be uh, a nag, but do something about what? We all been paying money to a protective association. Oh? Yeah, every week a couple of guys come around and collect. If we don't pay, we get our shops busted up. And if that ain't enough, we get our heads busted too. See, I still got three stitches right here on the top of my head. Oh, nice job. What the doctor use, a loom? I got this last week when those two guys come for the money. I couldn't pay, so one of them hit me with a blackjack. You're lucky he didn't use one of your salamis. Might have been a job for homicide. He knocked me out when I, when I come to... The shop was a mess. There was a note saying that they'd be back. Well, you better go to the law, Angelino. They'll give you good protection and won't cost you a thing. We discussed that at the meeting. But we decided it was too dangerous. We've been warned that if we go to the police, we'll get hurt bad. We got the families, Mr. Diamond. We can't take the chance. Yeah. Uh, tell me, have these two Garnifs been back to see you? Garnifs? Oh, Angie, you're going to be a lot of trouble. Garnifs, hoods... What's Gangsters, bad little boys. Oh, no, they ain't been back. Not yet. Well, for you or Rockefeller, my fee's the same, Angelino. One hundred clams, uh, uh, dollars a day in expenses. We took up a collection. I, uh, only got a hundred dollars. Oh, why does this always happen to me? I'm going to end up making Simon Legree look like Snow White. You only got a hundred, huh? Yeah, mm. but we thought of something... If it costs more, you can take it out in trade at any of the butcher shops. Well, it's liable to run into a lot of ham hocks. <laughs> it's the only way we can pay you. So I'll throw a barbecue. Let's go, Angelino. Where do we go? Well, you and the rest of the butchers have not only hired yourselves a private detective, but you've got a new addition in the butcher's union. You mean you... Yeah. Come on. I want you to show me how to carve a lox. <laughs> Well, that's what happens when your reputation gets around to the butcher shops. I'd been buying cold cuts from Giuseppe Angelino for the past two years and telling him what a great detective I was. I should have known he'd never take my word for it, so now I had to prove it. His shop was over on 10th Avenue, so we walked over and went in. He took me around behind the counter and handed me a white apron. I don't get it. Why you want to be a butcher? Uh, Angie, you want me to get a line on these two guys who do the collecting, don't you? Sure. Well, I can only think of two ways I could watch them and not look suspicious. Make like a butcher or crawl in with a ground round. Huh? Think what would happen if someone looked down for the price of ground round and caught it staring back at them. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's pretty good. Oh, now, come on, <laughs> Angie. It wasn't that funny. Oh, you got my hundred bucks, ain't you? It's a riot. Yeah, I am. Well, uh, uh, come on, let's... Uh, Show me what happens with this butcher racket. Uh, oh, customer. I'll show you later. Oh, nothing like learning fast. Let me handle the sale. Think you can? Yes, he comes. Uh, oh, good morning, Mrs. Hennessy. Oh, good morning, Mr. Angelino. Business must be good. I see you have a new butcher. Oh, uh, y yes. Uh, this is a Mr. Uh, Hangtooth. Hangtooth? Hangtooth. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Hennessy. Something I can do for you? Oh. Uh, Yes. How much is the lamb shoulder today? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, which one? What? Look, uh, maybe you better let me uh, take... Relax, Angie. I'll make it. Uh, which shoulder would you like, Mrs. Hennessy? Well, is there any difference, young man? Oh, yes, yes. You see, this lamb is really a ram. A ram? Oh, sure, yeah. Heard his shoulder playing against the eagles two weeks ago. We're also selling his shoulder pads at 21 cents a pound. Mr. Angelino. Uh, you'll find him hanging in the back with the spare ribs. Now, if you can tell me which shoulder you want, I'll wrap it up and send it off tackle between the liver and the knishes. Well, well, I never... Well, of course you haven't. It's the trouble with you people. Now, here's a nice little ram that played his heart out. 
Oh, by the way, the heart is a special today, 11 cents a pound. Hmm. Angie. Is she gone? Like a laundry in a tornado. What for do you want to do that, Mr. Diamond? She was one of my best customers. I wanted to get her out of here, and I wanted to get her out in a hurry. But why do you have to do it like that? Not a lamb, a ram. Which shoulder do you want, Miss Hennessy? Look, Angie, I'm sorry, but you can explain it to her later. Just as she came in, I spotted two guys heading this way. When they saw her, they backed off. They're standing across the street right now. Where? Right over there, in front of the cigar store. Hey, one of them has got a hatchet. Oh, no, not that one. You're looking at the Indian. Over there. Oh, oh yeah. Hey. That's them. That's the two guys who hit me on the head. They're the ones who come around to do the collecting. Well, they're coming again. You better duck. I'll take care of it. You be careful. They're pretty rough monkeys. Go on, I'll beat it. They're almost here. Yeah, yeah, I'll be in the back. One meatball. I got you under my skin. I got... Well, well, well. Good morning, gentlemen. What can I do for you? Where's Angelino? Oh. Well, uh, he's out buying some old buffalo. I'm the new assistant. Buffalo? Red. Shut up. And get your hand out of the pickles. All right, now tell me, new assistant, when'll he be back? Well, that's hard to say. These buffalo are in Wyoming. Oh, yeah. Carl, you know, I think this guy's trying to be funny. You win yourself a lamb chop. All you have it with or without the bloomers. You know something, Red? I think you're right. What's your name, laughing boy? Hangtooth. Hangtooth? Oh, I'm going to have more fun with that. It throws everybody. Well, look, Hangtooth. You know who we are. Uh, how many guesses? You won't even need one. We're in a hurry. We're collectors. Uh, we put all the scraps out in the back in a can. You can't miss it. I don't like you. Well, I have a friend. Maybe we could double date. Look, let's stop the clowning. If Angelina didn't tell you about us, it's going to be too bad for you. We're here for some money. We get it every week. Twenty-five bucks. Yeah. Last week, Angelino didn't have it, so he accidentally hit his head. We figured that all that blood would make him remember it this week. Well, I'm sorry, friend, but Angie didn't say anything about it. Tell me, what does he pay you boys for? Oh, little things. Protection, mostly. You see, if he paid us last week, he wouldn't have hit his head. You know something? I know a big, fat cop who would just love to hear all about this protection Angie's paying you for. You do, huh? Yeah, I do, huh? Well, uh, look, seeing as how you're a new boy around here, maybe we ought to tell you first. Why don't you do that? Let's go on the back. I like it here. I listen better. You do, huh? Is that all you guys can say? Now, get out from behind that counter. Well, I want to explain the thing to you. Yeah, go on, Red. Explain it to Mr. Hangtooth. Hangtooth! You'll have to pardon him. He don't hear so well. How's your hearing, Hangtooth? Depends on what I'm listening to. If it's dull, I might end up with an ear trumpet. You might end up with one whether it's dull or not. Now, seeing as how you're working for Angelino, you're going to need protection, too. So let's have the 25 bucks. I want to know what I'm buying. Sure. Here. Oh, now, don't you know it is nice to go around breaking up showcases, and especially with that nasty old sap? Well, you never know when things are going to get busted, see? Now, uh, don't you think you need protection, Mr. Hangtooth? Uh, tell you what I'll do. I'll pay you for protection if you'll pay me. Pay you? For what? Well... You never know when things are going to get busted. Like your jaw, maybe. Who are you? Hey, Carl, help me. Yeah, sure I'll help. Looks like my head-breaking day. Got his legs. All right, hold him. I'll tap him good. Give it to him again. Oh, Oh, he's a rough one, ain't he? Yeah, kick me in the mouth, will you? Hey, Red, let me try that, huh? Hang to turn such a pretty color when you kick him like that. He's out. You think he gets the idea? Maybe not right now, but when he wakes up, he's going to have a sore head to remind him. Come on, we'll come back for Angelino later. Well, you can't really blame brave little old me for going to sleep at that point. One, I could have handled, but in that cramped space behind the counter with both of them coming from different directions, I had to give up sooner or later. And I did for about 20 minutes. When I finally snapped out of it, I looked up and saw three heads staring down at me. Two herring with Angelino in the middle. 
You all all right, Mr. Diamond? Oh, Angie, do you always ask people that right after they've lost their blood? Here, let <sighs> me help you get up. Oh. Oh, swell. <laughs> now, uh, look for my eyes, will you? I didn't know what to do. I guess I should have called the police. Oh, why, Angie, you're really beginning to think for a chain. Oh, let me sit down. Uh, but when I thought about calling the police, I also thought about my family. Those two men might have beat up my family just like this. Yeah, 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 I guess you're right. You take the $100, Mr. Diamond, and forget about this. It's too dangerous. When they come back, I'll pay them the money and nobody gets hurt. Look, uh, look, I can understand why you're scared, Angie. Those, those two headhunters aren't kidding, but you can't let them get away with it. I can, and I will. I need taking no more chances. First, they bust up my shop, then they bust... No, thanks. I've had enough. Okay. Okay, Angie. Here's the hundred. No, no, that's yours. And then say it's a present. Buy yourself some new glass for the counter. What are you going to do? Well, now I got no obligation, Angelino. Just a sore face and a nasty disposition. I won't get back to normal until I find those two guys and tie their necks in a bow. I left Angelino's shop and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. I wanted to look up two sure bets for the police gallery. One named Carl and the other Red. Two guys who went around scaring poor little businessmen like Angelino. By the time I reached the station, the aches from the beating were making me very unhappy. And when I walked into the squad room, I spotted something that didn't make things any better. Yeah, what are you... Holy cow, Diamond. Well, Otis, I'm glad you noticed. It means I put myself together all right. What's the matter with your voice? I got a cold. Sound like you swallowed a rattlesnake. Yeah? Well, what happened to you? Oh, don't be silly. I always bleed just before lunch. Yeah, how'd it happen? It wasn't easy. Is the lieutenant in? Sure, go ahead. Thanks. Say, Otis, when are you going to start shaving in the morning? Why? What's wrong? Your five o'clock shadow is four hours fast. Oh... Hello, Walt. Now you listen to me. Wow! You like it? What hit you? Well, the bruises show up. I come on in Technicolor. Someone sure did a good job. Now that someone is two guys. One named Red and the other Carl. Red and Carl. Yeah. I got closest to Red. Name matches the hair, busted nose, about 190, and very nasty with a sap. And Carl? Dark greasy. Well-dressed, if you like the type. Big boy with a scar under his uh, right eye. Uh, you sure pick him. You know them? Yeah, I think so. Uh, here. Here's one of them. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, you are so right. This is sweet little Carl, all right. Carl Tate, sort of a new boy, import from Chicago. Uh, here's the other one. Yeah? Yeah, that's Red. Uh, they work together, a couple of muscle men. Mm, Red Dillon. <laughs> Arrests all over the place. One conviction... Salt with a deadly weapon. What they go after you for? Oh, they've been pulling a protection racket on some of the independent butcher shops. Who do they work for? They used to work for Jack Arnold before he got sent up. Well, I know they're not working this setup alone. It's too big. No, they wouldn't be. Hey, Tiny Easter is in town. Tiny Easter? Oh, used to be Arnold's right-hand boy. That's right. Came in about a month ago. I'd love to get something on him. Nobody has ever been able to nail him. Well, it adds up. He used to work for Arno, so did Carl Tate and Red Dillon. Now, if we can't pick him up just because two of his boys worked you over, I just say they weren't his boys. I don't want him picked up. I want Carl and Red. If Easter goes along with the deal, you can have him. And what are you going to do? Get cleaned up and pay Mr. Tiny Easter a visit. What's his address? Well, he's got an office on East 48th Street, uh, 804. Thanks, Walt. Uh, Tiny's a bad boy. Well, I'll take along my 38 just in case I have to spank him. Bye. <laughs> I left Walt and went back to my office. Took a clean shirt out of the closet and washed up. I locked up again, went down to the street, grabbed a cab. Twenty minutes later, I was standing in the reception room of Tiny Easter's office. A big guy with a bulge under his arm was trying to be as unreceptive as possible. So you want to see Easter? You got an appointment? No, I haven't got an appointment. Now tell Easter I'm out here. What's your name? You're going to get hung up on this. What do you mean? The name's Hangtooth. Huh? Yeah, you see... I'm act like an office boy and tell Easter I got a message for him from Carl and Red. You're a pretty fresh guy, ain't you? Yeah, and I'm going to spoil if I have to stand around much longer. You can spoil rotten for all I care. You ain't going to see Easter. He's busy. Okay. You know, you get so excited, you'll ruin your stomach someday. I don't think so. You don't, huh? Oh. Skeptic. Oh. 
What are you, Wong? I'm collecting scalps. Well, good for you. How'd you get by Lefty? He's tied up with a stomach ache. Swallowed a fist. All right, so you got muscles. Also, you got a pushed-in face. Lefty do that? Kyle Tate and his blood brother, Red. Oh? What'd you come to me for? They're working for you, Auntie. You smell like a cop. Name's Hangtooth. I doubt it. Good for you. I'd hate to go through that again. I'm a private cop. Why not good for you? I was in a butcher shop when your two boys wandered in and started playing squash with me. I don't like to get pushed around Easter. And I don't like your racket. I want Kyle and Red. And if I get you along with them, the state will hang a medal on me. <laughs> Looks like you kind of got nothing to lose. Look at it any way you like. Now, what about your two playmates? Well, I don't know what you're talking about, Seamus. I never heard of those two guys. I don't think you understand, Tiny. I'm pretty mad. I'm going to find these two guys, and I'm going to do it even if I have to be unpleasant with you. Why, Mr. Hangtooth, what do you mean by unpleasant? You break a leg, that's unpleasant. Oh? Well, uh, I got something in this drawer I might change your mind. Yeah? Oh. Oh, my hand. Okay, a busted hand. Unpleasant enough? <laughs> Take your foot away. You're breaking it in two. Drop the gun in the drawer. Okay. Harry. Now, uh, let me explain it again. If you go out and shoot 12 people tomorrow, I'm going to be sore about it. But when you start intimidating a bunch of hard-working little guys and their families, I go off like a skyrocket. Then when a couple of your cheap gunsels push me around, I explode. Look, friend, I tell you, I don't know these guys. <laughs> Look, Easter, please believe me. I don't know. You worked with him in Chicago. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, Easter. I'll work you over like an eggplant in a subway. Look, whatever your name is, I got boys. They'll take care of you. Who's going to tell them to do it? I am. With your mouth swollen shut? <laughs> Now, where do I find Carl and Red? Golly, you knocked one of my teeth loose. Then I got 31 to go. I guess you really don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, friend, I understand. <sighs> now, now, where are they? You still need some encouragement? No, no. No, that's all right. In a warehouse. By the 14th Street docks. What warehouse? Rogers and Sons. Big sign on the top. Mind if I use your phone? Yeah, go ahead. By all means. Don't you know it's not polite to listen, Easter? Well, what do you want me to do? Go to sleep. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, Rick. How about the Easter's? He let you use the phone? Yeah, he's asleep. I'm going down to Roger's warehouse near the 14th Street docks. Carl and Red are down there. I may need some help. I'll be right down. You better hop down here to Easter's and pick him up first. On what charge? I'll give you a charge after I see Red and Carl. Now step on it. But, 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 but... Contact. I left Easter's office looking like a second-class rest home and headed for the warehouse on 14th Street. It was getting late in the afternoon when my cab pulled up near the river and I got out. The cold breeze was kicking up little patches of white on the water and the light fog was moving in from the Atlantic as I started toward a big building with a sign on the top that read, Rogers and Sons, importing. The place was boarded up, but a window in the basement showed signs of recent use, so I jimmed it open and dropped down on the dark, cold pavement. I held my breath and listened. <laughs> radio playing from somewhere in the front of the building, so I started moving toward it. I went up a flight of stairs and onto the first floor. The radio was louder now, and I could make out an office door with a small light shining under the crack at the bottom. I moved up close and listened. Hey, Carl. Yeah? Shut up the radio. Okay. What do we have to hide out in here for? Because Easter said to. Besides, we don't know who that guy was we worked over this morning. He might have been a cop. So he was a cop. We worked cops over before. Look, Easter said we should stay undercover for a few days, so we stay undercover. Why not deal the cards? Oh. Off that top. 
get it. That's probably Easter. Yeah. 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 What? He did, huh? Hey, what's the matter? Boss. What's going on? I don't know. That was Easter. The guy we worked over was in his office. Pushed him around and now that guy's headed down here. Uh, we can handle him. Sure, but something's wrong. Just as Easter was going to say what to do, it sounded like he got into a fight. I had some guy tell him to drop the phone. Hey, the cops. Yeah. Come on, let's get out of here. Yeah. Good afternoon, boys. Hangtooth. Hangtooth. Come back here, Carl. Uh, help me. You shouldn't have pulled a gun, Red. Since when do you butchers carry rods? Since we get pushed around by guys like you. I'm going to go get your friend. You can't leave me. I'm shot bad. I can't take it back. The law will be here in a minute. You're a lousy butcher. I hope Carl pays you good. I'll see he gets a chance to try. I left Red lying on his face and ran toward the front of the building. The only way out was that window in the back and Carl was sure to be hiding somewhere in the dark hoping to get around me and head for the basement. There were a dozen places to hide in that warehouse, but I had one advantage. He couldn't see me any better than I could see him. I backed up against the wall. Come on, Carl. Red's hurt pretty bad. The law's on the way. You gotta get me to get out of here. He was behind a pile of packing cases and had a big gun just to make things suffer. I eased along the wall, trying to get behind him when I suddenly bumped into something. I turned around and felt to see what it was. A ladder. Straight up to the steel beams overhead. I put my gun under my arm and started up the rungs. It was tough climbing like that, trying not to make a sound and knowing all the time if he spotted me, I was an easy target. About halfway up, I stopped, held on with one hand, took off my shoe with the other. The idea was to drop the shoe, draw his fire, and nail him before he found out where I was. I dropped the shoe. Okay, okay, only take it easy. I can't see nothing, Lieutenant. You can't say nothing either. Shut up, you sound awful. Oh. Rick. Rick. Walt. I hear him, Lieutenant. Rick. Huh? Here's some guy that's been shot. Now, Diamond's been around here, all right. Rick. Here, Walt. Up here. What? Where the devil are you? Up here on this ladder. There he is, Lieutenant. See, where my flash is. Now, what are you doing up there? I had to get Carl Tate. He's over there behind those crates. Now, get me down. Well, why don't you climb down? Walt! Not in front of Otis! Oh, I forgot. Otis, go outside and call the fire department. Fire department? Yes, and tell him to bring a net. What? Will you get a move on? <laughs> oh, Okay. Rick. Yeah? <laughs> now you stop that! Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's so seldom that I ever get a good laugh at your expense. Okay. But you know this is a serious thing with me. How far up am I? I'd say about 40 feet. Oh. Now, now, take it easy. Just don't look down. Walt. Yeah? Promise me something? I won't tell Otis. I'll say you got stuck up there. Thanks. <laughs> what did you go up there for, anyway? I told you. I had to get Carl Tate. <laughs> I just didn't think until I was up. Imagine the guy who shoots it out with two of the toughest torpedoes in town having a horrible fear of heights. Boy, if that isn't one for the books. You know, I'll never forget the time that that little blonde trapeze artist got stuck. What? Yeah? I hate you. <laughs> Rick, hmm? how's your face? Fine. How's yours? Now you stop that. Oh, nice and soft. Rick. What's the matter? I'm just nuzzling a little. You're just nuzzling a lot. 
You want to nuzzle? You got to sing. Oh, no. No nuzzle. Oh, yeah. No sing, no nuzzle. Fiend. Piker. Just a real old nuzzle. I think you're after my earrings. No. If I sing? Yes. I was ready. I was listening. I will remember you In the silent and lonely night And the memory of your smile Will bring me back the light I will remember you When the leaves lie upon the ground With the memory of a kiss A kiss in summer found When the winds of winter come crying through the darkness Your lovely voice will come to me Even though in spirit across the miles that part us Crying I love you I will remember you Till the spring of another year Till I hold you close again I will remember Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm, come here. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, now what? I just remembered. I got a surprise for you. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Got a new television set. Now you can watch the fights. Well, uh, great, great. Where is it? In the den. But first, you've got to do one thing for me. What's that? Well, the reception isn't very good yet. I called the repairman, but he said to check the aerial. You can't come over until tomorrow. I'll fix it. Where is it? On the roof. The roof? But be careful, you've got to climb a ladder to get to it. What's the matter? Look, uh, Helen, wouldn't you rather... Fix the aerial first. First? First. Oh. Whom are you calling? Hello, operator. Give me the fire department. You've just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Nestor Piva, Paul Fries, and David Ellis. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. (coughs) Now this is Eddie King with an important reminder. Richard Diamond will next be heard on Sundays, one week from tomorrow. Remember, Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, will next be heard on Sundays beginning January 15th. Consult your local paper for time of broadcast. What's on NBC tomorrow? The hilarious Phil Harris Alice Fay Show. And for mystery, Sam Spade, directly following Phil and Alice. Next, Hollywood Star Theater with Dorothy L'Amour on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Oh, uh, may I do something for you, sir? I'll repeat the offer while I think of something. Uh, I beg your pardon? That's not the way I heard it first. Uh, did you want to see... Uh, Mr. George Victor... Uh, may I have your name? Well, let's, uh, let's trade. Mine's Diamond, Richard Diamond. Oh, of course. Mr. Victor's expecting you. Uh, that's too much to hope that you were... Uh, uh, he's waiting for you, Mr. Diamond. Thanks. 
Any door? Huh? Oh, oh, straight ahead. Go right in. Mm-hmm. Yes? Mr. Victor? Yes. Oh, you're done. Uh-huh. Come in and sit down. Thank you. You said you'd come immediately, and that was over an hour ago when I phoned you. Well, I didn't want to come to my bare feet. What? I was washing out a pair of socks. You're, you're sure you're Richard Diamond? Uh, reasonably sure, yes. Uh, my, uh, my credentials. Oh, all right. You were recommended to me by Lieutenant Levinson of the police department. I want to hire you. Uh, my fee is $100 a day in expenses. Unless we settle that first, I couldn't solve a case if it was tagged 100 proof. Here are two checks. One for 100, the other for five. Oh. You get the 100 if you take the job, and the other one if you do the job satisfactorily. Ah, tell me all about it. You may have heard that I bought the controlling interest in one of the biggest newspapers in the city. That I heard. All right. I'm going to expose the numbers racket. Eh, that's been tried before. I know, but this time it's different. I have all the evidence I need to expose one of the biggest operators. Aaron Ziegler. Oh, well, you do pick him big. You know him? We did some spitting at each other when I was on the force. Well, then you know what he is. Yeah. But you said you had all the evidence. Where do I come in? Ziegler's my affair. Yours will be my daughter. Here's her picture. Well, you can have Ziegler. I'm happy with this arrangement. This is no joke, Mr. Diamond. My daughter works for Ziegler. Oh? You got a million bucks for every Mongolian in Asia and your daughter works? Hobby, perhaps? She uh, became infatuated with a man named Doug Saxon. And went to work to support Will him. you listen to me? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Victor. Saxon has some connection with Ziegler. I objected to her seeing Saxon, and there, there was an argument. And being 21, she walked out? Yes. Hmm. Ziegler gave her a job singing in the Nocturne Club. I know the place. Now, what I want you to do is... I think I know, Mr. Victor. You've got evidence on Ziegler. That makes him an unhappy boy, and being unhappy, he wants to smile again. So he sets glamour lad Saxon loose. Your daughter falls for him and the frame's begun, right? Ziegler told me he was going to stop me from printing the expose of his racket. I, I know he'll use my daughter, Kathy. What does she have to say about it? She won't see me. Hmm. And you've got no idea what the frame will be? No, that's your job. Find my daughter, stay with her until the paper goes to press. And when will that be? Ten tonight. Hmm. Oh, all right, Mr. Victor, you've hired yourself a boy. I'll pick up that $500 check after I pick up the late edition. Good day, sir. Oh, uh... Yes? Uh, if you'll excuse the expression, uh, the retainer, $100. Oh, here you are. Oh, well, thank you. I'd bow from the waist, but my empty money belt might choke me. I'll keep in touch. A couple of phone calls to old acquaintances who still kept in touch with the shady side of our city, and I had Saxon's address... A half hour after I left George Victor, I was punching the buzzer to Saxon's apartment. Good afternoon, Mr. Saxton. Who are you? What do you want? I'm Mother Hubbard, and I've come to look at your cupboard. Ask me in. What's the idea? Who... Uh, this won't take long, Mr. Saxton. Listen, you... I was just going to ask you to listen. But since you ask first, go ahead and give me something to listen to. I... Uh... Did Ziegler send you? Well, maybe. Maybe not. It's a nice place here. All the scenery. Phonograph, big overstuffed chair. I'm glad you like it, but don't make yourself comfortable. What's in the other room? Look here, I don't know who you are or what you want, but... Maybe Ziegler did send me. Uh, did he? No. You a cop? Used to be. Always enjoyed my work. And I never enjoyed it more than when I was up against a character like you. Get out of here. Oh, now somehow getting tough doesn't look well on you. You're not the type, Saxon. From a quick but thorough study, I'd say you were more used to soft lights, sweet music, and setting up pigeons to be knocked over by your boss. I don't know what you're talking about. Kathy Victor. Know her? What if I do? You know her. And, uh, Saxon. Keep away from her. <laughs> oh, now you're scaring me, sure. Hey, 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 what do you want from me? Why are you doing this? I'm hired to do it. The name's Diamond, Richard Diamond, occupation private detective. Private detective? Yeah. You're going to make a phone call now. I won't. You're calling Ziegler to tell him you quit. I can't do that. Unless you want this floor lamp on your head. Uh, 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 Diamond, please. Please don't. Now, that's better. Now, go ahead. What'll I tell him? Uh, your health is bad. You're going to take a boat trip. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, then you think of something, but think. But I... Hello, this is Saxon. I'd like to talk to Aaron. Oh. 
Well, I'll call back. It's important. Oh, it's important. I've got to talk to him. All right, get him. <laughs> They're putting me through him. Hello. Hello, Aaron. Listen, I, I, I can't go through with the deal. Uh, something came up. I mentioned my name. A man named Diamond. Richard... Di- yeah, yeah, that's right. I don't know, Aaron, but please, don't blame me. I, 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 I did... Hello? Hello, Aaron? Aaron? He, he hung up. Good. You do the same. You don't know what he'll do, Diamond. You don't know him. Oh, but I do. Well, happy landings, glamour boy. You can't leave me like this. You know, after a long look at you, I don't think I'd like to stay. Bye, Saxon. 20 feet of the East River look good on you. Okay, so it was a bluff. I knew Ziegler wouldn't be scared off that easily, but when you go hunting ducks, you put out a decoy. I did. The decoy was me. It was an hour later that I got back to my office building and walked into the lobby. The elevator door there was open, but the jockey was missing. I was about to take the hard way up the stairs when... Diamond. Uh, oh, hello. Where'd you come from? I'm under a cabbage leaf. Don't believe it. Get in the elevator. Uh, I'll walk. Hey, Mac. Mr. Diamond don't want to get in the elevator. Uh, maybe he gets car sick. Get in, Diamond. <clears throat> uh, what's the big idea? Close the door, Mac. Sure. You know how to run this thing, Diamond? No. Start it up. Go on. Okay. Floors, please. I'll tell you when. This is far enough. Stop it. And keep your hands away from that door. What are you going to do? Eat your way out? He's a card, ain't he? Oh, now, come on. Fun's fun, but I got business. So we... We told you to take your hands off those doors. Oh, you did, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, he won't go down. Sure he will. He's just stubborn. Yeah. Give me that sap. <laughs> you see? Yeah. Think he's still tuned in? Let's see. Diamond. Hey, Diamond. Oh, he should know better than that. It ain't polite not to listen. Kick him in the ribs. <coughs> now, how about it, Diamond? You want to listen? He's shaking his head. He says yes. Okay. Now, stay away from the dame you're supposed to take care of. Go back to Victor and tell him you don't want the job. Tell him it's too rough, and if he don't understand, show him your bruises. Hey, uh, give him a bruise where it shows. <laughs> Look at that. I don't think he likes you kicking him in the chops. What does he want? Bedroom slippers? Okay, open the doors and let's get out of here. Hey, uh, think I ought to give him another boot just to make sure? Ain't you ever satisfied? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, let's go. You know something? You got an awful disposition. <laughs> You don't come out of a beating like that right away. A professional working over is like spending a weekend in a taffy machine. I reached out and tried to touch things, but it was like trying to paint the inside of a balloon with a hammer. I was numb, and when the little jabs of feeling started pinching my cheeks, I found out that I was warm and sticky. Finally, I pulled myself up, stood there for a minute, decided my legs weren't macaroni, and went to the washroom to clean up. Then I headed for the Nocturne Club. It was too early for customers, but there was a bartender and a girl with blonde hair playing the piano. Uh, we ain't open yet, Mac. Oh, you ain't? Well, give me a bib. I may cry all over the place. You look awful. Truck hit you or something? I was blowing a tube in a high wind. Yeah? Yeah. Screwed me eight feet into the ground. Ain't that terrible? Yeah, ain't it? Hey, um... Who's the dame with the fingers? Oh, entertains here. Name's Victor, Kathy Victor. Got a swell set of pipes. Mm. If you're looking for a job, we don't need no tuba players. Look, uh, here's for a drink and here's something for you because uh, you ain't open yet. Fix me something that'll turn me all one color. Sure. <laughs> Will it be black or blue? Uh, anything that goes with my tie. Bring it to the piano. I thought you wanted it. Oh, I'll laugh later. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. to that? Yeah. Tile in my hand. Hmm? From your looks, 
I'd say you needed time. Oh, don't let the bruises fool you, honey. When the swelling goes down, my face is fairly normal. Hey, uh, the blue and yellow make green, don't they? Yeah, why? I wasn't sure, but here's a drink anyway. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe you'll turn plaid. Sure. Here, put this in your pocket and go back in the bottle. Sure, thanks. Uh, yellow, you want another one? What's the matter? Why'd you stop? I need a drink, too. You get the jumps early, huh? I work late. Catches up with me. Oh, I try out running them for a day. It does wonders. <laughs> oh, I know you. You're a spy from Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm. Go ahead, play some more. All right. Kathy. Hmm? Your father sent me. What? Remember him? Why don't you leave now? Before we're really acquainted? I don't know who you are or what you want, but if my father sent you, I'm not buying. Okay, so you're having a good time now, but there's always the next morning. Thought of that? I don't need anyone to take care of me. Miss Victor, I'm not trying to take care of you. I'm doing a job. Maybe you don't know this, but you're being measured for a patsy. And your father's going to fit the same frame Saxon and Ziegler are working up for you. <laughs> you're crazy. But I like you, so I'll forgive you. I'll cut it out. I thought you wanted me to play. Look, you're spoiled. You had a mouthful of silver spoons and a handful of gold pieces for building blocks when you were a kid. But you're not a kid anymore. You're playing with bad boys. Maybe that's the way I like them. What do I have to say to make you realize, young lady... what, Diamond? Doug. Oh, well, well, Mr. Saxon. I thought you weren't going to be around here anymore. I changed my mind. (laughs) You've changed, too, since I last saw you. Well, only my looks. They'll heal. But tomorrow, you'll still be a greasy little gigolo. You can't talk that way to me. Oh, shut up. I... Well, never mind. Mr. Ziegler would like to see you. He saw you come in. And where is Mr. Ziegler? In his office, right back that way. Okay, okay. I haven't seen Ziegler for a long time. Maybe he wants me to set his broken arm. His arm's all right. Well, stick around. You may find out you're a chronic liar. Uh, keep playing, baby. I'll be right back. Like I said, I knew my bluff of Saxon wouldn't work, but I had what I wanted. A look in on Ziegler. And maybe a hint on what the frame was going to be. I walked to and into his office. Well. (laughs) Diamond. Hello, Ziegler. Oh, what happened to your face? Oh, got it caught in an elevator. Oh. What do you want with me? Diamond, here's a grand. Go out and have fun tonight, huh? All night. Oh, that money won't do me any good. Why not? That ain't counterfeit. Well, it's yours. That makes it so lousy, it's liable to crawl right out of my pocket. Well, then get rid of it in a hurry. You get rid of it. (laughs) You know, it's better waking up with a headache than not being able to find your head at all. Oh, look, Ziegler, you don't scare me. Now, let's level. You know why I'm here. Let Kathy Victor alone. You want to see me, boss? Well, look who's here. Oh, you know Tony Diamond? Yeah, we met, yes. Mm-hmm. He stubbed his toe on my chin. I don't know what you're talking about. When was this, Diamond? Uh, you know what it was, about an hour ago. You're crazy. Yes, Diamond. Tony was right here with me all morning. Okay. Mm-hmm. Are you leaving, Diamond? Yeah, yeah. Got any other ideas? Yes. I think you should consider my proposition. I'll let you know. About what? Things in general. Oh, no. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're happy. You make me that way, Diamond. You're working the dark, aren't you? I'll feel my way around. Believe me, Diamond, there ain't a thing wrong. Why, we love Miss Victor here. Just because her old man gets excited and hires you to bend an eye over her don't mean anything is wrong, does it? Since you ask me, I'll tell you. The answer's yes. You think so? Yeah. Otherwise, why beat me up? Why offer me a grand to look the other way? I don't know nothing about the beating. And as for the grand, I like you. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, okay, Ziggler. I think I'll go now. And just to make you happier, I'll probably stick with the case. So long, Diamond. Oh, uh, by the way, Ziggler. What now? Did you say this, uh, this gentleman's name was Tony? That's his name. Okay, uh, Tony. What? I wouldn't do this for everyone, but, uh, your shoelace is untied and you're allowed to trip over it. Eh, uh, what are you talking about, it? <laughs> Bombs away. Oh, that ain't nice, Diamond. When you do that to a man, you're liable to bust all his teeth. So what? You probably had your eye on the gold ones anyway. Be good, Ziggler. Well, hi there. You looking for another drink? Now, I got one here that I just fixed. You know, you kind of got me started on that color uh, business. Where'd the and girl I... go? 
Huh? Uh, what girl? You know, Anne Saxon. Where's he? Never heard of him. Have you ever been to Hamilton? Huh? Has his picture on all $10 bills. This one's suitable for framing. In your pocket. Can't do it, mister. Two pictures of Hamilton? Well, they sure would look nice on me, but, uh... I work here, mister. I got a wife and kids, see? Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, fella, forget it. Well, I fell for the oldest gag in the world. Kept busy someplace else while Saxon walked out with the girl. Now I had to find her. But where? I had until ten that night to stop a frame-up I didn't know anything about. But I played a hunch and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station and Lieutenant Walt Lemonson. I walked in on him. Diamond, oh no. Hiya, hiya, Walt. No, please go home. Nothing good can come of this. Why, Walt, I'm surprised at you. Well, I'm not. You've got some horrible joke up your sleeve. I don't want any part of it. I can only stay a few minutes. I, uh, I want to know about a guy named Saxon. Douglas Saxon? That's it. What's the matter? Can't you find things out for yourself? Right now, Lieutenant, I'm a citizen asking about a guy. Now, what have you got on Saxon, Walt? Not a thing. He was clean when we picked him up a couple of times. Why was he picked up? Why are you so interested in him? Wood goes with my business. Oh. And if I tell you? Well, I'll tell you something sometime. Now, come on, Walt. Give. Okay, okay. He was picked up on suspicion of handling narcotics. But that's a job for the vice squad. Why is he so dear to you? He's working for Aaron Ziegler. This, Mr. Diamond, is not new. He'd be just a boy to work a frame for Aaron, wouldn't he? If it involved a gal, yes. This does. How? Don't know. Yet. But, uh, if she was picked up with narcotics on her, it'd be a nice frame, wouldn't it? What makes you think it would be a frame? This gal looks too healthy. Yeah, but you could be wrong. Why? Because for some stupid reason I like you, and I don't want to see you make a fool of yourself. Oh, why would I do that? For this dame. What dame? The one that Saxon's going to frame. Is he going to frame her? Of course he is. I'd better get her out of it. Certainly, that's just what I was saying. Bye, Walt. Uh, Rick. Yeah? Thanks. What for? For not dragging out that who's on first routine. I don't think my stomach could have stood it today. Oh, Walt, you're an idiot. Yeah. Be a good boy. When you pound a police beat in New York, you make a lot of unusual friends. And if you ever get in plain clothes, those friends come in handy sometimes. I grabbed a cab in front of the precinct station and headed for Chinatown. Walt and I had known an old Chinese named Wu Li who had been around a long time. He knew everyone and everything that went on in Chinatown. And if anyone knew where we could find Saxon, he did. Saxon, Saxon... It's possible I do not know him. Oh, I think you do. <laughs> Just so. He said this man Saxon deals in sweet dreams. However, his rumor not proved. Does he ever come to Chinatown? You like perhaps a cup of tea? I ask this as a favor, will he? Uh, enemies are made to do evil. Friends to ask favors. Sometimes is no difference. Will you tell me, Wooly? You ask in name of friendship? I do. Very well. In Chinatown is establishment owned by a man named Fu Shen. Perhaps, I say perhaps, this man Saxon is there. He's been there before, hmm? My eyes are old, perhaps mistaken. <laughs> Not your eyes. I shall give you address, then make call to Fu Shen. You will be allowed to enter his establishment. May you live 10,000 years. And may you live to mourn at my funeral. The old boy gave the address and I left his shop. Five minutes later, I walked through the back door of the old frame building and Fu Shen bowed from the waist to let me upstairs to a private room that fronted a long hall. I noticed there were three other closed doors in the floor aside from the big room downstairs. If Kathy Victor was in the building... She had to be in one of those rooms. I walked into my room, closed the door behind me. There was a bed in one corner and a chair near it. A low table was near the bed and a dim light threw diagonal shadows like fingers across the walls. I waited until the proprietor had time to get downstairs, then I opened the door and looked out in the hall. It was empty, so I started throwing open doors. I had to be quick before I had a dozen hopped-up thugs on my back. The first was a cold turkey... This room's in use. Uh, Diamond. 
Well, Mr. Saxon, I presume. Look, 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 Diamond, lay off me, will you? Where's the kid? I don't know who you mean. You will. Oh, Diamond, my arm, you're, you're hurting. So here's another twist for size. Ow. Now sing, Saxon, and loud. Uh, look, you got it wrong. I... Oh. How wrong can I be? Oh. Okay, okay, but it wasn't my idea. I can believe that. Zeke oh. thought it up. You pulled it off for a couple of grand. Listen, if I tell you, will you let me go? The girl's all you want. Let me go, will you? Where is she? In the next room. Walk ahead of me. And in case you get any ideas... Oh. Now walk ahead of me. Oh. Oh. Open the door. You, you got my arm! You got another one, but not for long if you try anything. Open it. There. There she is. Oh. Out cold. She's all right, just... Yeah, just knocked out, huh? Let me go now, Diamond. Sure, sure. So this was the game, huh? Bring her here, knock her out, plant narcotics on her, and then push her into the street to get picked Look, up. Look, I showed you where she is. Now give me a break. You know, I was just thinking of that. How would you like it, in the arm or in the jaw? Crumb. Now, oh, come on. Come on, Mr. Victor. Let's, let's wake up now. Come on. Come on. Mr. Diamond, uh, you got bad habits. Yeah. Yeah, Tony, and one of them is running into you. Okay, Diamond, keep your hands where I can see them. Right on the ends of my arms. Oh, what a sense of humor. All right, Diamond. All right, what? I think you're going to get a hole in the face. Oh, just a minute, Tony. You hear anything? Yeah. Those are police cars, Tony, coming here. You're crazy. Yeah? You don't think I'd come here alone, do you? Get over there by the door. Look, Tony, you got yourself all dirtied up for Ziegler. Is he here? No, he lets you and Saxon walk around in the mud. Those cars are almost here, Tony. Shut up, I got orders. They'll rub me out, I know. But what if you do? How are you going to get out? Got an answer for that? Uh, they ain't coming here. Now, they didn't go past, Tony. Now, listen. I got nothing against you. Make a break for it. Out the back door. All I want is the girl. Go on, fast, before it's too late. Yeah. I ain't going to take the rap for nobody. Diamond. Rick. Diamond, you in here? Diamond. Uh, up here, Walt. Come on. You all right? Uh, sure, but I sent a package, special delivery, out the back door. Uh, we've got that covered. Otis will sign for it. Uh, okay, wonderful. And now... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What are you doing here? Why'd you come? Why? My ulcers told me you were up to some stupid business. I know when you left me, you had some dizzy idea in your thick skull. I'm a cop, you know. I checked with Wu Lee, too. Hey, that the girl? Yeah, yeah. She'll be all right. Coming around okay. Uh-huh. Oh, and Saxon. Mm-hmm. Hey, what did you hit him with? Start. Limp. Yeah, Walt. Walt, listen. If the papers get word of this, this kid's father will be ruined. If she's in the clear, you've got my word. No one will hear about it. Well, I know she's in the clear, but I can't leave her here. I got a job to do. I was hired. You want to take her, huh? Yeah, I I think she'd like to go home. Okay, I'll take your word. She's all right. Now, beat it fast before the narcotics boys get here. Thanks, Walt. Come on, baby, snap out of it. Come on. Get her out of here before we're all booked for obstructing justice. I'm going. Uh, hey, hey, Walt. Yeah? How are you going to explain knocking over this joint before the vice squad? Why, didn't you know I got a reported homicide here? I'll let you know what happens. Where'll you be? Oh, silly boy, where else but Helen's? Now, come on, Cassie, baby, on your feet. On your feet. Uh, uh, Walt. Now what? Uh, I love you. I'll marry you later. Now take off. Oh, my stomach. Oh. Hello, Rick. You're late. Hey, get a load of those silk slacks. They're lounging pajamas, darling. I've been in a lot of lounges, dear. Never saw anything like those. You like them? Yeah, yeah, they're all right. The stuffing that gets me. Rick. Be proud of what you got, baby. I knew a guy who had 16 toes on each foot. What good did that do him? He used to tell everybody he was a duck, made a fortune selling his hair for pillow stuffing. You look awful. Hmm, could have been worse. Oh? Was she pretty, Rick? Who? The girl in the case. What case? Why were you late getting here? Oh, well, I, uh, I had to take a girl home and introduce her to a man, her father. I see. How long did that take? Uh, how'd you know about the girl? Hmm? Lieutenant Levinson phoned, asking for you. Um, I took the message. He said, she's all right. And a man named Saxon did a lot of talking. Oh, wonderful. Who's she? Who's Saxon? Oh, well, read all about it in the papers, dear. Is she blonde or brunette? Both. Blonde with a brunette disposition. Hmm. Got the piano, too. Huh? She's pretty as I am. Oh, honey, nobody is. 
Oh, well, nothing to do until the office opens again tomorrow. Time on my hands. You in my arms. Nothing but love in view. And then if you fall, once and for all, I'll see my dreams come true. Moments to spare for someone you care for, one love affair, just the two. Mm-hmm. With time on my hands and you in my arms. And love in my heart All for you How long did it take you to take her home? Oh, let's forget her, Ellen. I'm willing. But are you? Mm Mm-hmm. Look. Oh, what nice big checks. Yeah, another day, another 600 bucks. Are we going out for dinner? With what? Well, you've got a handful of checks. Baby, i got news for you. The banks are closed. Oh, come on. I know the bartender at the Nocturne Club. Oh, no. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell with Virginia Gregg as Helen and Ed Begley as Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Larry Dodkin, Gene Bates, Stanley Waxman, Paul DeBob, and High Averback. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC today? Great shows for Sunday on NBC include The Adventures of Sam Spade and Theater Guild on the Air. Helen Hayes and Walter Abel co-star on Theater Guild today. And for his caper, Sam Spade turns to television for help. You'll enjoy both these stellar shows. Sam Spade, then Theater Guild, today on NBC. Now stay tuned for James Melton and Harvest of Stars on NBC. National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Are you Mr. Diamond? Yeah, unless there's a warrant out. Mr. Diamond, I'd like to talk to you about a man. Oh, don't look so unhappy. Can't talk about girls all the time. Mr. Diamond, this is pretty serious. I'm scared stiff of him. Why? Because he's dead. And here's another exciting case from the files of Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, homicides with class. Huh? Ah. Well, that's a pretty good answer. What kind of a slogan was that, Shamus? Oh, my goodness. Sergeant Otis. That's right. Well, don't take any bets. I know a dozen people who would swear you were something else. Oh, now stop the gag. I got something important to talk to you about. I know what it is. 
You do? I bet you've lost your shoes. Oh, uh, what makes you think that, wise guy? Well, I drove by the docks this morning and spotted two landing barges with laces. Oh, I give up. Here, you better talk to the lieutenant. Rick? Hello, Walt. Why don't you lay off, Otis? He was just calling to ask you to do a favor for us. What kind of a favor? The 5th Precinct is having its annual dance next week. Oh, now, Walt. Well, what's the matter? Just a couple of songs and then you can go home. Oh, sure, sure. Just like last time. I was just going to be a couple of songs last time, too. But before those lovely cops let me go, I had a crack in my voice like the Liberty Bell. Now this time, I promise. Only two songs. All right, all right, all right. If one of them's Mule Train. Sure, but why Mule Train? I want to whip Otis for sound effects. Oh. Mr. Diamond? Oh, uh, wait a minute, Walt. I think I spotted a client. Okay, Rick. I'll tell the committee you'll be there. Bye. Are you Mr. Diamond? Yeah, unless there's a warrant out. Mr. Diamond, I... I'd like to talk to you about a man. Oh, don't look so unhappy. Can't talk about girls all the time. Mr. Diamond, this is pretty serious. I'm scared stiff of him. Why? Because he's dead. Hmm. That's right. He's supposed to be dead. Well, bring him over. We can make a fortune from Barnum and Bailey. I guess I better go. No, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe you better tell me about it. Okay. I'm Martin White. I go to Barrett College. I'm an ex-GI. I'm a senior now because I couldn't start until I was released from the hospital three years ago. Hospital, huh? What was the trouble? I got hit at casino. How long were you in the hospital? Two and a half years. Two and a half years? Yeah, I... Okay, I fell apart up there. Oh, oh. psychosis? Yeah. Oh, go on. The other day I was on my way to class when I saw this man I was telling you about. The one who's supposed to be dead? Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. He used to be in the same outfit with me. I saw him killed at casino. Oh, well, so you made a mistake. So he looks like the guy. No, no, it's not like that. Maybe I better tell you, and then you'll understand. Uh, Go ahead. Well, his name was Jarvis, Paul Jarvis. I was a captain with the Fifth Army when we went into casino. And Jarvis? Private. He'd been with us since we pushed Rommel out of the desert. Everybody hated him. Why? Goldbrick. Never missed a chance to dog it. But he was smart, plenty smart. There wasn't anything we could pin on him. Yeah, I know the type. He was great in a street fight because he was big. And I mean really big. Big and nasty. But up on the line, he went to pieces. Okay, go ahead. One night, we got a report that a man answering Jarvis's description had killed a corporal in a fight. By the time the details got to me, the Germans had opened up with everything they had. I was ordered out on patrol, so I took Jarvis with me. You took a big chance. You know it. There was one witness to the killing, an old man in the town. If Jarvis knew he might be identified, he'd have gone over the hill shore. So I figured I'd watch him, keep him with me until the Germans slowed up and we could show, show him to the old man. Oh, he moved up. The crowds had the main body zeroed in with their 88s. Our job was to move up, try to spot a path through the enemy artillery pattern. We had to belly down, and Jarvis and I ended up in the hole together. They'll spot us, sure. They'll correct and drop those things all over us in a minute. You keep your head down, Jarvis. I tell you, they'll spot us. Now, you listen to me. You raise your skull one inch out of this hole before I tell you, and so help me, I'll drill you myself. Okay. You hate my guts, don't you? Knock it off. <laughs> this is real funny, this is. Two guys this close hating each other. Next time I'll pick a bigger hole. Captain White. What? About that murder. Can it. You think I killed the guy, don't you? I don't think anything right now. Just those cock tanks down there. You're thinking about it all right. You and everybody else. You all hate me because I'm not a tin soldier like you with ideals sticking out all over your fat face. I told you to knock it off, but you wanted it laid on the line, so I'll tell you. Yeah, I hate your guts. Okay. That's good enough. I killed that corporal, Captain White. You're out of your mind. I am, huh? Well, this is as good a place as any to go over the hill. You're crazy. Get down. Relax. I got a bayonet pointed right at your belly. Jarvis, don't. Go on. Cry. Whine. (laughs) I'm going to put you in for a purple heart. Only you'll have to pin it on your blanket. Jarvis. Jarvis, for the love of... Now you're only a number on the record, Jarvis, you dirty rotten. You're going to take a little while to die, Captain, so you can think about me getting out. I'm taking off, and I'm leaving the rest of the saps with all the honor and glory they want. So long, Captain. It's all yours. Jarvis! Come back here! Jarvis! Well, it was one of those lucky things, Mr. Diamond. I got out. Spent a day and a night in that hole until the medics found me. What about Jarvis? I'd swear he got the 88 right on top of him. But now you think you've seen him and you're not sure. I'm not sure of anything right now. But I saw that 88 hit 
And I saw Jarvis go down. Okay, okay. Let's say you did see Jarvis. He got out some way. Looks pretty simple to me. Call out the authorities and tell them you spotted a man wanted for murder. There certainly should be a lot of guys from your outfit who could identify him. No. He's done something to his face. Maybe the shell did it for him, but I know it's him. You can't miss a guy that size. A lot of big boys. Sure, but he's got the same rotten eyes. That didn't change, and that nasty smile he gets. I'd know him anywhere. In a dark room, I'd know him. No, but you, uh, you said you were scared. Why not go to another school? I can't. I've got a job up there, and I've got a wife and a kid. That's why I came to you. I can't go to the police. They might put me back in that hospital. They'll think I'm slipping again. Up here. Uh-huh. Well, let's, let's say it is, Jarvis. What in the world would a guy like that be doing in a college? Don't you think I've asked myself those questions? Uh, just forget the whole thing. No, uh, no, 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 wait, Martin. Look, if I prove to you one way or another about this Jarvis, will you forget about Casino? Yeah. What name is he using? Blackwell. John Blackwell. Okay, let's go. Don't you, uh, don't you get a fee or something? Your wife a good cook? The best. Well, I'm staying for dinner, and after you see what I put away, you'll probably wish you'd paid the hundred a day in expenses. Usually I'm pretty hard about my fee, because the trouble I get into has to be balanced on the book some way. But a young guy comes in with a real problem, and old hard-headed Diamond gets a fast softening of the skull. Well, two hours later, Martin White, me, and my... Rural soft skull were on the campus of Barrett College and in the converted Quonset hut the whites called home. <laughs> He's hungry, Mr. Diamond. Ah, yeah, fella. Wow. Well, nice looking boy. Yeah. Takes after his mother. Uh, Martin, uh, Martin, if we're going to do something about this thing, we'd better get a move on. Hmm? All right, where do we start? Well, I think I'd like to look at this. Uh, what's the name this guy's using, you say? Uh, Blackwell. Oh. Uh, well, I'd like to look at Blackwell's school record. How about it? Well, I think I can fix it. Let's go. Oh, dinner's at six, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, we eat early because I'm night watchman on campus. I go on duty at seven. I'll be on time, Mrs. White. It's Nan. Oh, well, love corned beef and cabbage, Nan. <laughs> well, I'll walk out with you. I have to go to the store. Come on, Mr. Diamond. We'll walk Nan out across the street. Martin, look out! <laughs> oh, that idiot. Uh, Must have been drunk. Nan, are you all right? Oh, sure, but you, Martin, he came right at you. I know. Mr. Diamond, that guy wasn't drunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Nan, uh, you think you can go to the store alone? Oh, certainly. I, I'm fine now. But that car... Now, uh, come on, Martin. We've got to check those records. Well, I uh, see you at dinner. And, Martin, you listen to what Mr. Diamond has to say. That man was probably drunk. Good girl. Yeah. What about that car? Could have been an accident. Let's think it was for a while, anyway. <laughs> Now, this is where they keep the records. Hello, Susie. Hi, Martin. Well, hello. Hello, Susie. Uh, this is Mr. Diamond, Susie. Mr. Diamond, Susie Wirt. It's really a pleasure, believe me. We'd like to look at the file, Susie. You are a new professor, Mr. Diamond? No, no, just a friend of Martin's. Married? Not a bit. Why? Pretty square, huh? Mm, sometimes, but I can learn. Yeah? Well, I might just start some night classes of my own. That sounds like fun. In about five years, you let me know how your education is progressing. Oh. Age is a problem with you, huh? My dear, when I stumbled over 30, everything got to be a problem. Now, uh, do you think we can, uh... Yes? The records, Susie. Remember? Yes, yeah, Susie. The records. Oh. Okay, which ones? We want to see the file Everything on... from B to C. Okay. But if I get in trouble for this, you uh, may have to make it up to me in some way. I'll buy you a soda. And I'll let you... Here they are. B to C. Ah, thanks, Susie. I'll let you know when we're finished. Okay, be a recluse. Only I got some ideas about that, too. I'll be in the next room. Ah, youth. Well, let's take a look. How come you asked for everything from B to C? No sense in letting everybody know what we're doing. If we just asked for Blackwell's file, Susie might have said something to him. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh here it is. Yeah, sister, uh... 
John Blackwell, 28, resident of McAllister, Oklahoma. Hey, got a load of this. Height, 6 feet 6, weight 240. Like I said, he's a big one. Hmm. If he fell down, he'd be halfway home. Look, Martin, where where can I find this Blackwell? Now, let's see. What does it say about his classes here? Mm-hmm. It's 2.30 now. Yeah, he should be in English lit. Now, take me over there. You want to see him? I want to meet him. You want to meet him? Oh, now relax. Sooner or later, you've got to talk to him. Oh, Susie. Susie. Yes? Oh, Susie, we're finished. I'm not. How about that soda? I'll take a rain check. Lots of rain up here. <laughs> Susie? Yes? Bye. Well, we left Susie in the middle of a pout. Martin took me across the campus to another building. We went up a long hall and stopped at the door marked English Let. Martin looked in for a minute and then pointed. That's him. That's him right there. Now, relax, relax. Hey, he must get a bloody nose from the altitude. He's head and shoulders over the whole room. I'm sure of it. I tell you, when I get around to that guy, I'm sure of it. That's Jarvis. Get back from the door. The class is breaking up. Let's get out of here, Mr. Diamond, uh, No, 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 no. I want you to introduce me to I him. can't. I tell you, I got the shakes. Oh, you're going to have to face it sooner or later, Martin. Yeah, here, here they come. Okay, I'll try. Uh, there he is. Uh, uh, Blackwell. He sees you. Over here. Now, what do I say? Just introduce me. I'll do the rest. Yes? You call me? Uh, uh yeah. Uh, you don't know me, but, uh... I understand you're a new student. I'd like you to drop by the fraternity house and meet some of the boys. Oh, well, thank you. I'd be glad to. S.A.E. Uh, this is Mr. Diamond, Mr. Blackwell. How do you do? Fine, thank you. You a professor here, Mr. Diamond? No, just a friend of Martin's. This uh, your first year at college? Yeah. A little late, aren't you? What held you up? Service? That's right. Oh, well, I was in the Army myself. What outfit were you in? I didn't say I was in the Army, Mr. Diamond. Matter of fact, I was in the Navy. Oh. Well, Mr. White, I have to be going now. When would you like me to stop by the house? Oh, any time. Around six. Most of the boys are in then. See you then. Nice meeting you, Mr. Diamond. Yeah. Well? You've never met him before. I mean, here on the campus? No, why? When he left, he called you Mr. White. Yeah, and I didn't introduce myself. Well, I, I do know one way to clear this whole thing up. How? Oh. Fingerprints. Washington's got a record of Jarvis. If I can get Blackwells, we can compare them. It's a swell idea, but about as easy as going after a mountain lion's molar. Oh, I'll think of something. And you go on home and stay with the wife and baby. All right. I left Martin and cut across the street to the college malt shop. When I went in, a bunch of kids were having a time playing records and making dates, so I slipped by them and eased into a phone booth and put in a fast call to the 5th Precinct Police Station and Walt Levinson. Fifth Precinct, Sergeant Otis. Oh, good grief, I got the zoo. Oh, you just call up to make whites crack shamus? No, I'll put the lieutenant on. But don't growl at him, he's close enough to snap a collar on you. Oh. Yeah, what do you want, Diamond? Oh, that's a pleasant way to answer the phone. What have you noticed know been doing, setting fire to the commissioner? Oh, I give up. Where are you? I'm up at Barrett College. A college? Sure, sure, sure. I'm trying to talk to science department and the bidding on your sergeant's brain. They've got gargantuas and they need a match set. Now, will you please be serious? Okay, okay, Walt. Now, look. I've run into something that has a good chance to end up looking like homicide. I can use some help. Well, you know that's out of my district. Look, I just want you to do some checking for me. Find out about a John Blackwell who's supposed to come from McAllister, Oklahoma. He's a student here. Uh, what do you want to know about him? Oh, how long he lived in McAllister. Family, friends, the usual things. And then do some checking on a boy named Jarvis, Paul Jarvis. Check his fingerprints with the military authorities. See if he was ever in McAllister and if he knew Blackwell. Okay. Uh, where can I call you and how fast do you need it? Uh, wait a minute. What's the matter? I just spotted someone in this malt shop. Are you in a malt shop? Yeah, 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 and I gotta hang up. I don't want to lose this boy. Well, where can I reach you? Call the local law and tell him I'm on the campus. Wearing a beanie? Funny. Pretty funny. Ah, Mr. Blackwell, isn't it? Huh? Oh, yeah. Mr. Diamond. That's right. Mind if I sit down? Not at all. Just finishing my malt. 
Looks good. I think I'll have one. It is good. Good for you. Makes you healthy. Live a long time. Well, I guess that's what we're all after. I guess so. How long have you known Martin? Martin White? Yeah. Not long. How long have you known him? Just met him today with you. Why? Oh, nothing. Wondered how you knew his name. Oh, he was pointed out. Mm-hmm. Well, I gotta be going, Mr. Diamond. This little chat has been very enlightening. Goodbye. Goodbye. And now... Hey, uh, waiter. Huh? Oh, you want something, mister? Yeah, the small glass. Just the glass? Don't touch it. Well, what's wrong with it? Is it contagious or something? Yeah. It's five bucks. Huh? Give me a napkin to wrap it up in. Oh, a collector, huh? Yeah, something like that. Okay, take it. I had a girlfriend who used to collect beer cans, but this is a new wrinkle. Thanks. Oh, it ain't nothing. Come back again and get a load of our ice cream dishes. You'll lose your mind. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't look where I was going. Yeah. I hope I didn't break anything of value, Mr. Diamond. You're going to hog a sidewalk, that's for sure. Uh, let me help you. I can make it. Uh, it's a mess, isn't it? Taking one of our famous malls back home? It might be, Jarvis. I beg your pardon. I said it might be, Jarvis. Name's Blackwell, remember? Oh, oh yeah, I forgot. You see, Martin White says he thinks he was in the service with you. I told you I was in the Navy. I didn't say Martin wasn't. Well, you're mistaken. My name's not Jarvis. Oh, well, isn't that funny? Martin's so sure. He was even going into New York in the morning to see if he couldn't find some of his old buddies who might have remembered you. I hope he has a nice trip. Well, I'll tell him when I see him. But I don't get it, Mr. Diamond. Why did you tip him? Oh, you knew it before I tipped him, Martin. I don't want him to skip before I can get the information on him. But now he's sure to take off. Not until he gets you. Oh, Mr. Diamond, do you think that... I know, I know you'll try, Nan. Martin is the only one here at Barrett who can actually identify him. He knows I'm suspicious of him, so he'll go after Martin first and then me. He's got to make his play. But you said that he... Martin, uh, give me your hat and coat. Why? What are you going to do? Take your place as night watchman. Whatever he's going to do, he'll try it tonight. I wanted to try it on me. No, I won't let you do it. Look, I've pushed it this far. It's all set up. Oh, honey, don't let him do it. Yeah, Mr. Diamond, I... Now, I you let... two lock yourself in and I'll come back. Huh? Oh, please, Mr. Diamond. Hey, hey, the hat fits pretty good. I'll have a look. But there must be something we can do. Oh, sure. Sure, Nan, there is. What? Save me some corned beef and cabbage, huh? <laughs> It was dark when I walked out with Martin's hat and coat and started across the campus. I had a flashlight. The night was black, solid black. But I had a feeling that sat on my shoulder and raised goosebumps. When you've been in this business as long as I have, that feeling is an alarm ringing inside, telling you the trouble is creeping up. Halfway across the campus, I stopped. I heard nothing but the usual sounds that come with night. Dampened, muffled sounds. I walked on. And I heard it. The sound of someone walking well behind me. I stopped again. Maybe it was Jarvis. Maybe it wasn't. There was one way to find out. Keep going. If it was anyone with no business with me, okay, he'd stop following. I cut to my left away from the main walk and toward the shadowy bulk of the college buildings. I kept going until I reached the gymnasium building. I was leading my pigeon to me. But who was the pigeon? My toes were beginning to turn in, so I figured I was. Then the bulk of the big building popped up in front of me. I tried the door. It was open. I went in, closed the door behind me. There was no light at all. Only a funny sound that I couldn't identify. A peculiar humming, and there was a smell. Chlorine. Yeah, chlorine. Now I knew where I was, an indoor pool. The hum was the filtering machinery. I wanted to turn on the flashlight, but in a place like this, I couldn't give Jarvis the tip on where I was. I had to get out... So I felt my way carefully along the tile floor. I kept what I guessed was the middle of the walk around the pool, and then... He was in with me. 
I stopped, but he didn't. Surprise, Buster. <laughs> What's the difference? None, I guess. Where's the real black hole? Where you're going to be, Diamond. Stay right there, Jarvis. Sure, and let you shoot off your mouth. All right, Diamond. It's all the same to me whether I get you first or white. I got to do both. Now we'll see just how tough you are, Diamond. <laughs> well. The boy's got a gun. You missed, Diamond. And too bad the flash gave you away. Now I gotta do this fast. This is it, Diamond. Diamond. Diamond, put the I can't swim. No. Well, Buster, I got news for you. I'm not gonna teach you. This won't take long. Just enough to get you a little water log. Hold your nose, Jarvis. It helps. Diamond! Diamond! Martin! Lights, Martin! Get them on! Yeah. I have to come. I can't let you do it alone. I heard the shot and I... Where's Jarvis? Jarvis? No, I, I think we can take him out now. He's done. Here, grab him. Yeah. He dead? No. Here, give me a hand, Mr. Diamond. Wait. Hey, hey, I'll get my breath. You know, uh, Martin... Jarvis was a bad soldier, but in the Navy, he had just been plain lousy. We've got to pay you something. Okay, okay. Mail the recipe for your wife's corned beef to a gal named Helen, huh? But, Mr. Don't Diamond... Don't forget I... it. Uh, Jarvis won't... I mean, he won't... Oh, come back? Oh, no, no, no. The Army picked him up. They've got first crack at him. Then come the uh, McAllister authorities who'd like to talk with him about the murder of John Blackwell. So that's how he got Blackwell's papers. Sure, sure. Blackwell was alone in the world. He was going to come here to school, but Jarvis hitched a ride and... Well, once the guy kills... He'll do it again to beat the rap. Blackwell and Jarvis were both from McAllister. Yeah, yeah. Jarvis figured this college would be a great hideout under a different name, papers all in order, but uh, <laughs> you saw him and he saw you, and that put a crimp on his plans. From there on, you you know the rest. Now, I guess... Oh, I'll get it. Be back in a minute. I'll send your clothes to you when I get back to the city, Martin. Uh, no hurry, Mr. Diamond. Oh, Mr. Diamond, the phone's for you. Me? Hmm. But no one knows I'm here but the McAllister Police Force, Levinson, Otis, Jarvis, Susie, the campus and you. Well, he asked for you. Oh, thank you. Hello? Diamond? Uh, Levinson? Yeah. Well, what's on your mind? Are you all right? Never better. Why? Because we got the report on Jarvis. He's a bad boy. You watch yourself. Don't get caught alone with him. Oh, sure. Sure, Walt. I'll be real careful. The only place I'll be seen with him is in a swimming pool. Huh? And I'll cut the wise crack. Wow, wow, wow. What's that? You say something? Uh, hold it a minute, Walt. Oh, Bill, shh, please. Sorry, Mr. Diamond. I guess the phone awakened him. Diamond. Diamond, what are you doing? You got asthma? Quiet, Walt. Uh, hold it. A uh, man, a uh, Martin, uh, bring the baby here. But he's never done this at this time. Oh, never mind. Bring him here. Okay, you asked for it. Now, 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 baby, baby. Shh, shh. Stop calling me baby. It's twilight on the prairie, and the moon will soon be high. She'll be herding every star up in the sky. We'll lope along to dreamland, and we'll bid each care goodbye, while the wind blows through the sagebrush with a sigh. 
So hush, little darling. Little dear, go to sleep, little darling. I'm right here. Let my shoulder be your pillow. You'll be safe as you can be. Little darling, you mean all the world to me. We'll always be together. And I promise faithfully that your dreams will all come true. Just wait and see. So hush, little darling. Little dear, go to sleep, little darling. I'm right here. Hello? Hello. 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 Say, what's going on over there? Oh, now, hold it a second, Walt. I got somebody who wants to say hello to you. That's a good boy now. Now, say hello to the lieutenant. Hold it. Get off the line. Walt. Yeah? Bye. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Paul Dubob, Sammy Hill, Jerry Hausner, Jane Webb, and Dave Ellis. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC? Phil Harris celebrates his birthday this evening by getting into just a little more trouble than usual on the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. Theater Guild on the Air presents Jane Wyman, Beatrice Pearson, and Mel Ferrer in the psychological melodrama, The Willow and I. It's the best entertainment on the air, and it's yours for the listening today on NBC. Now stay tuned for James Melton and the Harvest of Stars on NBC. Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond, this is Walt. Where the devil are you? Where I started out to be, down on River Street, looking for well, the guy... Well, you'll be right there and wait for me, but you might as well stop looking. Why stop looking? Take my word for it, he's not there. Well, if you're so smart, where is he? The city morgue. We fished him out of the river ten minutes ago. <laughs> Here's another exciting case from the files of Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, first over the bars. That's nice. Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Busy? No, why? I'm lonesome. Can't you come over? Honey, I'd love to, but you can never tell when... So- uh, Mr. Diamond. Oh, see what I mean? Oh, a customer. Well, let's see. What can I do for you? Uh, I want to hire you. Helen, the man wants to hire me. Oh, good. I'll call you back. Bye. Bye. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, uh... Uh, Wellington, Mr. Diamond. Hmm. Casper Wellington. Oh, well, pull up a couch and tell me the details, Mr. Wellington. I need a bodyguard, Mr. Diamond. Why? Oh, it's not for myself. 
It's for Timothy. Well, why does Timothy need a bodyguard? Someone's trying to kill him. Oh, you've been to the police? Oh, yes, yes, but... They feel it's not quite important enough for them. You mean this Timothy's life is in danger and the police won't handle it? Yes. Isn't it ridiculous? I don't know. Has anybody tried to kill Timothy before? Well, no one has exactly tried to kill him, but I very definitely expect an attempt. Hmm. Well, now, look, uh, this uh, Timothy, is he a friend of yours? Oh, yes. A very good friend. So what makes you think that someone is going to try to kill him? Mr. Diamond... I came here to hire you to protect Timothy. I'm perfectly willing to pay you your fee, but for the moment, the rest of your questions must go unanswered. Well, uh, my fee's $100 a day in expenses, Mr. Wellington. Still perfectly willing to pay it? Here's the cash. Mm -hmm. And there'll be another 100 if you protect Timothy long enough for me to get him on a train tomorrow. Where's he going? Out of town, where he can be safe. What's Timothy's last name? That will also have to go unanswered. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. Supposing I do take the job, where do I meet this Timothy? How will I know him? If you take the job, he'll be in your office in a matter of minutes. Well, something sure doesn't ring up right, but the 200 fish and expenses, I'd play footsies with a cobra. Good. Now, I'm going down to the train station to pick up Timothy's ticket. When he arrives, I expect you to remain with him constantly. Until tomorrow? Oh, I got a small apartment. I hate the bundle. Don't let him out of your sight for a moment. I want him alive and well when he gets on that train in the morning. Does he play Pachisi? Well, I doubt it, but you never can tell. He might like it. Hmm, dandy. Have him at Grand Central at 8 o'clock. I'll meet you. Do you know of any way I could possibly learn to hate money? If I did, I would never have come to you. Uh, good day, Mr. Diamond. Oh. Hmm. Atlantic Bone and Fertilizer. Oh, that's a pit. Just wondering how a new business would work out? Now, what's wrong? Uh, I have a very unhealthy feeling that I've just let myself in for something I won't like. Oh, the client? Well, kind of. I've got a guard, a friend of his. What's the matter with that? Oh, I'm not going all through that again. The client just came on like secret service. I got the name of the guy he wants guarded, and I know that someone's going to try and kill him. And that's it. Rick, you be careful. Honey, honey, the client shoved 200 bucks in my rural hot hand. Oh, good. What do you want me to do? I'm trying for capitalists this year. Didn't your client go to the police first? Sure. He went to the police with the... Hey, you. Me? What? Yeah, you. Rick, are you listening? Yeah, I'm listening. Put down the phone, friend. We want to talk to you. Well, if you're listening, why don't you answer my question? If your client went to the police... That's better. Well, now, I'm a sport, especially when someone's got a gun pointed at me. Oh, the gun ain't gonna hurt you, chum, if you answer a couple of questions. Where's Casper Wellington? Who? You're gonna be difficult? Look, you got a gun on me. Who wants to be difficult? You don't know Casper Wellington, friend? Uh, never heard of him. We well, seen him come into the building. No, oh, so you figured he came to see me. It's such a small building, only about a hundred offices. Oh, that's pretty funny. Glad you liked it. No, but we didn't. You're the only private detective in the building. We figured maybe Casper wanted to hire you. What would he want to hire me for? What did this guy do? How do you like that, George? Now he's a nosy comic. Mm. Durante gets away with it. Friend, I have just decided your humor bores me. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty bad, ain't it, Tony? Suppose we push his face around, huh? Maybe he don't feel like no more Joe. Oh, now, wait a minute. I don't know anything about this Casper or whatever his name is. What good is it going to do to work me over? Well, now, you see, none of you men got real nasty dispositions. We've been crossed, and then you make with the jokes. We don't like being the only ones unhappy, so we think maybe you ought to join. <laughs> now, now, look. Now, hold it a second, Jones. What for? He's a setup. Oh, no, wait. We mess him up, the law comes. We got to find cast, but we ain't got no time to play patty cake with the cops. Uh, I just want to cross the mouth. Forget it. Look, friend, you sure Casper Wellington didn't come in here? I couldn't be more positive. Okay. Put down a rod, George. Uh, that don't look so unhappy. Maybe the shamus is lying. We catch him telling a fib. Just think of the fun you can have later on. Huh? Come on. We'll leave him? Yeah. So long, friend. And uh, for your sake, I hope you've been leveling. Yeah. See you around. Yeah, bye. Hmm. This is... Now, you listen to me, Richard Diamond. The next time you hang up on me, but I'll how... never speak to you again. But, uh, and you but... better have a pretty good excuse for doing it this time. But, uh... You know I take a lot of things from you, Rick, but never, never once have you hung up on me. Helen, please. And I think it was rude and inconsiderate. 
Helen. And I want to know right now, this minute, just what kind of a poor, lame brain excuse you're going to come up with. Helen! Well? Now, look, baby, I don't know what's going on. This is like doing business in a roundhouse. The only reason I hung up on you was because two guys stole in here and shoved guns in my face. Right. And they were looking for the guy who came in earlier and hired me to look after someone named Timothy that I haven't even seen yet. It sounds awfully confusing. It is. Oh, hold the phone. Here's somebody else. Come in with your hands up. You Richard Diamond? Yep. You got a crate there addressed to you. Oh, well, that figures. Bring it in. Helen. Yes? You sent me maybe a present? No. You want me to? Yeah, but someone's beating you to it. Where do you want it? Good grief. Put it down right there. What's the matter? The present. The biggest crate you ever saw. A crate? What's in it? How do I know? Well, open it. Okay, Mr. Diamond. Stand right here. Yeah. There you are. I hope you still be very happy. Hmm. Helen. Yes? Hold the phone. I'm going to open this thing. All right. Oh, no. Oh, get away. Get away. Now, get on. Get on. Don't come up here. Don't, don't, don't. Oh, Helen. Rick, what in the world's the matter? Helen, if this is your idea of a joke. Please calm down and tell me what's wrong. What? Can't you hear it? Well, I heard something, but I thought you must have eaten your lunch too fast. Well, I'm standing on my desk trying to fight off a monster. What? Call up Charles Adams right away. A monster? Yes. I'd swear it was a seal, but I know my friends better than that. This thing has got to be poisonous. Yes, a seal. Hey, he's not so bad. He's applauding. <laughs> you must have liked that remark about Adams. Now you stop it. Do you expect me to believe all this? Uh, she doubts you, fella. Say a few words. Rick, who in the world would send you a seal? I don't even need the look. This has got to be Timothy. Oh, it is Timothy. When he heard his name, he made like a curtain call. Sounds like one Richard Diamond. Hey, that's pretty... Nothing. I'll call you back. Where are you going? I'm going to take Timothy right back to Mr. Casper Wellington and tell him that... Yes? Oh, for the love of... I don't know where to find Mr. Casper Wellington. Well, there it was. It was pretty silly. The smart, shrewd, level-headed Richard Diamond, for the sake of a couple of hundred fast bucks, winds up playing nursemaid and companion to a honking seal... Just to make sure it was, Timothy, I took a look at the crate, and there on top was a small printed card. It read, This is Timothy. If you want him to do something, throw him a fish. Herring. Signed, Casper Wellington. Well, that tore it. My temper was already pushing my hair up to attention, so I went out to the nearest delicatessen and came back with a bag of fish. With this, I lured Timothy out of the building and down on the street. I had to find Casper Wellington, so 60 pedestrians and one unhappy cabbie later... Timothy and I stole casually into the 5th Precinct Police Station. Oh, well, hello, Sergeant Otis. Oh, oh, how are you, Shamus? Huh? How what? What'd you just say? I said, hello, Sergeant Otis. No, after that. Yeah, 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 that was it. Something wrong, Sergeant? Yeah! Otis, Otis, say hello to Timothy. Timothy, this is Sergeant Otis. Lieutenant! Lieutenant! Go on over and kiss the Sergeant Timothy. Go on. Oh, no, no, no. no. Get him away from me. Get him away. Oh, Otis, he's not so bad. Lieutenant! Now, Otis, come down off that desk. You look sillier than I did. He's trying to eat me. Oh, be quiet. You too, Timothy. You'll wake up the lieutenant. Here's a fish. Throw it to Timothy. Enough for you, Diamond. You'll probably take my arm along with it. Get away. Get away. Help! What the devil is going on out here? Otis, what are you doing up there? Hello, Walt. What are you doing to my sergeant? And you shut up, Otis. That wasn't me. What do you mean? It wasn't you. Of course it was you. Walt, meet Timothy. How do you... Ah! I'd hate to think what would happen if someone wandered in here with a walrus. Come on, Timothy. Let's go see the brave old head of homicide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get him out of here. Oh, relax, Otis. Timothy's as scared as you are. Oh, yeah? What makes you say that? He's probably thinking there's more like you. That would be a horrible shock to anyone, even a seal. Oh. Come on, Timothy. 
Uh, you get that thing out of here right now, Diamond. Everybody's standing on something. You'd think it was a steam bath. Up till now, I've had two reported homicides and a couple of fat robberies. And if you think you're going to wander in here with that thing and confuse the whole department, you're mistaken. Now get it out of here. Oh, Walt, it's only a seal. Have a fish. I'm not hungry. No, no, Walt. It's for Timothy. Feed it to him. He'll, he'll love you. Yeah? Do you think so? Sure, sure, Walt. Go ahead. Try it. Okay. Here, Timothy. Hey, he's applauding. Sure, he's a nice little fella. Now, climb down and help me. Uh, give me another fish. Oh, won't come down without it, huh? Okay, Walt, speak. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I want to feed it to Timothy. He likes me. <laughs> See? Oh, lovely. Why don't you two get engaged? Oh. <laughs> Well, after everybody got used to him, Timothy made the rounds of the whole department with the commissioner being the only exception, of course. I told Walt the story about Casper Wellington and the two Gonnips who had come into my office looking for him. So Walt put Otis to work checking on the whereabouts of my missing client. Along about three in the afternoon, Otis pounced in with some news. Uh, hey, Diamond. You find something? Oh, hi, Timothy. Yeah. Uh, say, I checked with the Humane Society, and they report some guy who lives down by the docks. The name's Wellington, all right. He's been turned in a couple of times because he raises seals, and they make a lot of noise. Oh, uh, and Lieutenant, we just got a report on another homicide. Well, thanks, Sporty. You tell the Lieutenant all about it, Otis. I'm going after Casper Wellington. What's the address? Uh, here it is. 918 River Street. Come on, Tim. Goodbye, Timothy. Otis. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. What was I saying? Homicide, remember? Just a little old homicide. I left Walt and Otis climbing over the furniture and headed for the address of Casper Wellington. Timothy and I grabbed the first cabbie who didn't believe what he was seeing, and 20 minutes later, we pulled up in front of a building on River Street. Thanks, cabbie. Yeah, sure. Thank the man, Timothy. Uh, mister? Yeah? I didn't ask you nothing when you got in the cab because I just didn't believe it. Is that the seal you got with you? You're expecting maybe a raccoon? Do you always take him around with you like that? Sure, we're brothers. Right by the house sometime for dinner when Mom isn't taking a swim. Hmm. She's not a very good driver, is he, Timothy? <laughs> you know it. Come on, you're going home. Hold it right here, friend. Hmm? You hide him. This is a gun in your back. Oh. Yeah. Oh. You lied to me, friend. I'll go stand in the corner. Nah, don't move. Okay. George, grab the seal. Oh, yeah. now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can't do that. Want to bet? Come here, you. Take your hands off that seal. Shut your mouth, friend. <laughs> Next time you don't get it across the neck, I'll give you the rat on the skull. Okay, friend. I got him. All right, get him in a car. And you, stay put. One bad move, you're going to get shot up very bad. Come on, George. You got that thing in the car? Yeah, he's saying let's get out of here. All right, friend. Yeah. You uh, see this? I got pointed at you. I see. Good. Forget about today. You won't see it again. Open that big yap of yours and it goes boom. Now turn around because when we leave, I don't want you looking back for no license number. <laughs> Well, I stood there while they drove off with poor little Timothy. Then I made a quick dash across the street and to a store with a phone booth. Seconds later, I was hearing one of the most beautiful sounds in the world. Diamond, this is Walt. Where the devil are you? Where I started out to be, down on River Street, looking for my client. Well, you stay right there and wait for me, but you might as well stop looking. Well, why stop looking? His house is just down at the end of the block. Well, take my word for it, he isn't there. Well, if you're so smart, where is he? The city morgue. We fished him out of the river ten minutes ago. What? He was suffering from a hole in his chest. Dead before he was tossed in. Oh, Walt, Walt. Remember those two guys who came into my office earlier? Yeah. Well, they just put the snatch on Timothy and belted me across the neck for my trouble. They swiped the seal? Yeah, so get on here. I'll meet you at Casper Wellington's house. <laughs> Sir. Well, let's case the place. I've got a skeleton key. Walt. Walt. It's open. See? 
Now, if you'll notice as I walk in, at no time do my feet leave my legs. Very funny. Yeah, smells like somebody's been cooking up a fish stew. Crummy joint. Ooh, get a load of that kitchen. What a mess. Oh, weren't cooking fish, Wall, just cleaning it. There's still a mess of them left in the sink. Well, Casper raised seals. Where are the rest of them? Wall. Yeah? Come here. What is it? Get a look at this backyard. Holy cow. Bunch of dead seals. Who in the world would do anything like that? Maybe your uh, two friends. Hey, what's this? Oh, what's what? This bag on the floor, leather bag. What's in it? Ah, nothing. Wait a minute. Some kind of dust at the bottom. I'll save it. We'll have it analyzed when we get down to the station. We've got to check up on those two guys who kidnapped Timothy. This is the craziest case. I got a hunch. Sure, it's crazy, but if I'm right, it's also pretty smart. Let's go to the station. <laughs> Uh, hey, Lieutenant. Yeah, Otis? Uh, we just got something else on that Casper Wellington guy. Oh? What did he steal? Hey, how'd you know? Just a guess. Well, what is it, Hammerhead? Well, uh, it uh, seems this Wellington guy works at, uh, I mean, used to work for David and Sons. David and Sons? Uh, diamond importers. Oh, that ties it. Would somebody mind telling me what the devil this is all about? And Rick, you stay out of it. Now, Otis, what about Wellington? Wellington? Oh, he ran off with a load of diamonds. Yeah, 50,000 bucks worth. Hey, but you... Don't... Rick, will you please, for the sake of my sour stomach, tell me exactly what it is you know? I'd be glad to, Lieutenant. It's very simple. Wellington comes to me and asks me to guard Timothy. Two guys kidnap Timothy. That we heard. Then we find a bunch of dead seals in Wellington's backyard and the remains of a pile of clean fish. So? So, the two guys who kidnapped Timothy were obviously after something, and the seal was part of it. Hey, maybe Timothy wasn't the seal after all. Now, what would he be, Otis? Well, if those guys wanted him that bad... Maybe he was a mink. Oh. oh, that bag you picked up, Walt. Have that powder in the bottom analyzed. I'll lay six to an even that it's diamond dust. Well, you think... Yeah, yeah. I think Timothy's got a stomach full of diamonds. What? I think Casper was mixed up with the two guys who grabbed the seal, but in some way crossed them. Why? But... He had to hide the loot, so he stuck it in some fish and fed it to Timothy. Then he left Timothy with me for protection until he could get him shipped out on the train. And in the meantime, the two guys who found Casper killed him and went back to his house to find the loot. Mm -hmm. They figured out the fish like you did and killed the seals in the backyard trying to find the stuff. You, my friend, went a herring. Otis, have the yeah. powder in the bottom of this bag analyzed. Put out a 108 on Timothy. Yes, sir. Diamond here will give you the description of the guys who grabbed him. Mm -hmm. We'll never find him that way. Uh, you got a better idea? Maybe, yeah. Uh, look, you said those two guys killed Casper and then went right over to the house to look for the missing diamonds. Yeah. All right, they knew where to look, but they didn't find anything. So they waited for me and Timothy. So? So Casper Wellington probably told them all about it before they killed him, trying to save his own life. All right, I'll buy that. So what? So by now, they must know how hot those diamonds are. They're certainly not going to try to get rid of them here in town. And then they leave town. Yeah. And with that much loot, it would be a little risky if they tried by car. All right, all right. How do they do it? The same way Casper thought of. Ship Timothy out on a train. Wait a minute, Rick. Otis. Yeah? Put in a call to all units. Tell them to cover the airports, train, and bus stations. Be on the lookout for a seal that's about to be shipped. Come yes. on, Walt. Where to? Well, as long as Casper Wellington already made the arrangements by train, let's go down to Grand Central. Maybe our two seal nappers will keep the reservation. Well, Walt and I piled in the squad car again, and 20 minutes later, we were standing in the middle of Grand Central Station with a bag of fish and a weather eye out for the missing seal and his two abductors. Now, where do we start? Well, Walt, why don't you just go ask information? Just say, I'm looking for two men and a seal. The seal is hiding $50,000 worth of diamonds. Now, you stop that. This was plenty silly before a jewel robbery and a homicide get into the picture, but now it's gotten ridiculous. Well, if I was a seal, where would I go? They have to crate him, the shipping department. And so, with their trusty bag of fish, the two brave detectives oh, walk nonchalant. shut up and let's go. Oh, no, come on, let's go get something. Well, smile, Walt. This kind of case doesn't happen but once every 10,000 years. Think of your report to the commissioner. If you don't stop kidding with me, so help me hey. out. Hey, Walt. Well, now what? Look, those two guys. Where? Going down the ramp. Oh, they got a big box. That's it. Let's take them. Well, you said they got guns. They were pointing things at shot bullets. Could be guns. Take it easy. They're going up to that counter. Yeah. Hold it. Hold it here. No sense in starting a shooting match. Too many people. Well, what'll we do? Maybe the seal's not in the box. And if I pick them up without the loot, we may never find it. I got an idea. Go ahead, genius. Timothy likes fish, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. He likes well, fish. take this bag. They know me, so you walk down there and move in close to the box. Timothy's bound to get a whiff, and if I know Timothy, he'll raise a few flippers. You want me to? You want to get those diamonds, don't you? Oh, give me the bag. Don't snap. 
people will just think you ran out of cologne. Now get going. Yeah. Uh, pardon me, but I'd like to find out about sending something. Oh, yeah? Well, what's the idea, Buster? We was here first. Shut up, stupid. You boys must be really sending something big. You're too nosy. I told you to shut up. Yeah, yeah, some, uh, some furs. Oh, live ones? Hey, Tiny, what's with the seal? Will you shut up? What? I hate to mention it, but your furs are throwing a fit. He's busting off. Okay, boys, that's all I wanted to know. Let's take a seal. He's gone after the sack. This guy laid down. It's a sack full of fish. Hey, what's the idea? Hello, stay right there. Hey, Rick. Cops, were you... All first? right, bud, drop it. Huh? I said drop it. Okay, okay. You ain't taking me. Look out, Rick. This guy's got a gun. Ah, let go. Let go of my hand. Will you get the seal off? He's chewing my hand off. And drop the gun. All right, all right. Get him off. Come on. Get him off. <laughs> ah. How do you like that? Oh. Timothy grabbed this gun up by the gun hand and made him drop it. I'll be uh, done. Crazy <laughs> seal nearly kill me. You and your bright idea. Ship the seal, you ship. Ah, okay, go. boys. Here's a bracelet for you. Let's go outside. Uh, Walt, Walt, wait a minute. We got to get the jewels. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, I'll take care of these two guys, and I'll take Timothy to a good veterinary. Okay. Uh, uh, Walt. Yeah? If it means surgery, keep in touch. Sure. Bye, Timothy. Now, don't be unhappy. Oh, how can I help it, honey? I, he's been in surgery for nearly an hour. Oh, but he'll be all right. They got a good vet. Oh, I hope so. I was getting attached to that seal. Oh, I got it. Yeah? Rick? Yeah, Walt. Yeah. How's Timothy? He had the diamonds in him, all right. Oh, but how is he? Well? Uh, go ahead, Walt. You can tell me. I, I, I can stand it. He's very weak. Doctor says he thinks he doesn't want to live. No will. Oh, what's the matter? He was such a happy seal. I think he misses you, Rick. Every time someone mentions your name, he kind of honks and raises a weak flipper. I better come right down. He's sinking fast. Oh, you think maybe if he heard my voice... Uh, uh, can you get a phone near him? Yeah, yeah, wait a minute. Okay, I got it next to his ear. Say something. Hello, Timothy. Oh, Walt. Yeah? Walt, ask him if he's seen a picture called Mrs. Mike. He says he saw it. Didn't like the leading man. Oh. Loved Evelyn Keys. Oh. Ask him if he liked the music. Yeah, he liked that. Well, put the receiver next to his ear and I'll sing him the theme song. Well, go ahead and try. Anything in case of an emergency. If her name... Is Kathy, she's mine alone. When I walk with Kathy, proud am I. She's the girl I'll marry, and cross the threshold I'll carry. And I'll love but Kathy. Till I die She's the only angel I've ever known She's a maid No man is worthy of Although girls are many Compared to her, there isn't any. Only Kathy do I love. Well, Walt? I did it. He's better? Old Timothy, that a boy. I guess the singing did it. What do you mean you guess? When I sang with the Peter Pan Five, we played two weeks at the Carl Gables Hotel in Florida. So what? So what? I'll have you know five minutes after I opened my mouth, every seal in the Biscayne Keys came in and sat ringside. That sounds like a pretty good act. 
What'd you give it up for? Well, I got a sore throat one night, and the place was up to its ears in alligators. Rick. Yes, Wall? Bye. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Faye Baker, Junius Matthews, Billy Bletcher, Tony Barrett, and Larry Dobkin. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Isn't that right, Dick? Yeah, 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 that's right, Eddie. Oh, by the way, Ed Begley, who plays Lieutenant Levinson on our show, would like to say a few words to his old friends in Hartford, Connecticut. Well, I just want to say, on behalf of all of us here on Richard Diamond, congratulations to radio station WTIC in Hartford, Connecticut, where I got my start in radio, and which this week celebrates its 25th anniversary of service to the people of southern New England. Thank you, Ed Begley. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. (laughs) Governing a country is a pretty hard-headed business, and we don't usually think of our government as a dealer in dreams. But in one respect, it is, because it's a dealer in savings bonds. Your particular dream for the future can come true through the judicious purchase of United States savings bonds today. As for buying United States savings bonds, the process is simplicity itself. If you're employed by others, use the payroll savings plan where you work. Your employer will set aside a specific sum from each paycheck for the purchase of bonds. If you're self-employed, use the bond-a-month plan where you bank. Either way, you'll be saving with regularity, with certainty, and with profit through the purchase of United States savings bonds. What's on NBC today? You'll hear Charles Boyer and Dorothy McGuire today on Theater Guild on the Air in Autumn Crocus. And there's the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show to add to your Sunday listening pleasure. Be sure to hear Charles Boyer and Dorothy McGuire on Theater Guild on the Air and the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show today on NBC. National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Walk this way, Diamond. If I do, well, I tell my friends. Hey, this is the morgue. Yeah, wise guy. You should feel right at home here, Otis. Oh. Hello, Rick. Hi, you all. What goes here? I want you to take a look at someone. You know who this is, Rick? Oh, the poor little devil. He was murdered, huh? Yeah, shot right in the back. And here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah, yeah, you run something. Uh, how do you do? Are you the manager of this little uh, haven of rest? A boarding house, boarding house. I run it, I run it. I heard you both times. Uh, what do you want, huh? What do you want? Information, information. You move. You nuts or something, huh? You nuts? I'm looking for a girl. I What's the thought... matter? Read the sign, read the sign. It says rooms for rent. Rooms. Beat it, beat it. You know, if you ever get around to running at 33 and a third, you'll save a lot of breath. Smart guy, real smart guy. No, I got to work. Got work. Wait I... a minute. Now, wait. Here's five dollars if you can tell me about a girl named Elaine Tanner. For ten bucks, I couldn't tell you a thing. Don't know her. Don't know her. She lived here? So, it's a secret for me. A secret. 
Now... Yeah, here, 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 here. Take a look at the snapshot. A man and a girl. Do you know the girl? Mister, I got maybe 10, 20, 30 different people every month. Every month. They come, they go, they pay rent. That's all I care. They pay rent. All right, all right. Did this girl ever pay rent here? Maybe I remember her face. I never remember no names. No names. Is anybody living in her room now? Why you want to know, huh? Huh? Well, I'll tell you a secret, bud. The girl is my sister. When we were little kids, my mother and father ran away from home to become acrobats in a circus. This broke up my sister, and she left too. Now, Mama and Papa are back, and I want the whole stinking family together again so we can take the light out of the window. <laughs> sure. For ten bucks, for ten bucks, maybe I'll show you her room. All right, you're in business. Now, here's your ten. Thanks. The fingers are mine. Uh, this way, down this way. How long does she live here? Oh, not long, not for long, maybe two weeks. Then what? <laughs> Then comes an old guy one day. Yeah, an old guy and... Uh, and what? She goes away with him. And you know what else? Yes, I know what else. The old guy was the same guy in the snapshot I showed you a minute ago. He was with a girl. Sure, sure. Okay, okay, look around, look around. She ain't in any damn drawers, she ain't. Oh, that cupboard, she ain't. She ain't no place. Now, tell me, did she leave anything here at all? Just junk. Junk, newspapers, magazines, newspapers. So she was a bookworm. Well, okay, I guess that's it. Let's go. Let's get out of here fast. Uh, uh, who are they shooting at? Who's who in that they... house next door where the shots came from? People. Thanks. Uh, they shooting at you? They shooting at you? No, anybody who wants to get rid of you. Nobody, nobody. Oh, mister, please go now. Now. Look, look. There's 20 bucks more if you do me a favor. I do you one favor and get shot at. Who knows what'll happen for 20, huh? Who knows? Twice as much fun. Now, look, go through the stuff she left here. And... I told you there wasn't nothing, nothing. Well, go through it anyway. If you find anything that might give me a lead, call me up. Here, here's my card. Uh, but, uh, which a diamond private did that? Hey, it says you're a dick. A dick. Strictly private. Now, is it a deal? 20 bucks now? There'll be more if you find something for me. Okay, okay. No, no, no. Please beat it. And don't come back here no more. No more. Window glass costs dough. I knew it wouldn't do me any good to look at the house where the shots came from. Because whoever played me for a clay pigeon would get out. Fast. Now, only one person knew I was likely to visit that boarding house. The man who sent me there. And his name was Morris Clinton. Vocation? Multimillionaire. A vacation or hobby? Wolf. And an old one at that. But why should he take a shot at me? Thinking like that figured out to a heart-to-heart talk with Clinton, so I went to see him. But if he knew anything, he played it straight. Shoot at you? But that's ridiculous. Well, I agree. I agree, Clinton. But look at my side of it. This morning, you sent your chauffeur to my office to bring me here. Then you hired me to find a girl for you. A girl named Elaine Tanner. And she wasn't there. Right, right. She wasn't there. Just an empty room in a boarding house. That, uh, that's all the information I could give you about her. I'll even buy that. I've worked on less information before, but here's my point, Mr. Clinton. I was shot at. I'm used to it, but I don't like it. I told you, I know nothing about that. Believe me, Mr. Diamond, I know nothing about it. I do believe you. We'll just say someone doesn't like my poking around that boarding house. Have you got any idea who that might be? No, I haven't. I swear it. Hmm. Okay, okay. I'll wrap it up right now. As I said, I've been shot at before, but uh, you've been so pleasant, Mr. Clinton. From here, the price goes up. You uh, you don't want to go on with the case? Not at these prices. All right, forget it, then. I gave you $100 this morning. Keep it. You forget you ever saw me. Oh, you're so sweet. It'll be a pleasure. Uh, Diamond, just a moment. Yeah? Uh, what has happened is uh, between you and me? Oh, oh, yes, but yes. Oh, I, I will have to report those shots. All right. Sure. The police don't like to have people taking pot shots at each other. It makes for confusion in a big city. Uh, wait, Diamond, wait. Something else, Mr. Clinton? I, I, I have my own reasons for not wanting anyone else involved in this. I, I'm i sure you and I can come to an agreement. Oh, well, it's just possible, Maury, that you and I may not see wallet to wallet. What, uh, what would you say if, uh, if I offered you a thousand dollars bonus to, to keep on the case? Offer or a suggestion? I'll, I'll make it a deal. Put it on paper. A check. And I trust you. <laughs> ah, okay, Clinton, if you feel that way about it, post-date the check. A week from today. If I don't show up with Elaine Tanner by then, the check is yours again. Uncashed. Very well. Here you are. Thanks. So long, Mr. Clinton. I'll keep in touch. Where are you going now? Back to my office to wait for a phone call from the little guy at 118 Parker Avenue. Oh. Oh. 
Well, hello there. Did you hear everything you wanted to? I, I beg your pardon, sir. I was just coming and asked Mr. Clinton if I should drive him anywhere this afternoon. Oh? I'm in here. Right away, Mr. Clinton. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, sure. Go well on, Christopher. The minute I left Clinton and Chris, I began to get that lousy feeling again. The only thing that made me feel anywhere near normal was the thought of the thousand bucks that would be mine in seven days. For a thousand bucks, I'd stand up for target practice for the big mole. I didn't have much to go on, just the knowledge that old man Clinton wanted me to find Elaine Tanner and that somebody, who up to now had proved to be a bad shot, didn't want me to find her. With that peaceful thought in mind, I sat in my office hoping for a call from the little manager of the boarding house on Parker Avenue. I'd been waiting about an hour, and then... Ah, save your knuckles and use a fire axe. Come on in. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Well, 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 Christopher. All your driving finished for the day? Mr. Clinton sent me to see you, Mr. Diamond. Oh, this is the second time today. What's he trying to do, make dear friends of us? Not exactly, Mr. Diamond. Uh, he wants that check back. What? He's changed his mind. Oh, from what I know of him, it needs it. He wants to call off the whole thing. Something happened. Elaine Tanner show up? No. Oh, and he sent you to get the $1,000 check back. That's right, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I know an easier way. Why doesn't he just stop payment on the check? I'm only carrying out Mr. Clinton's orders. Are you? Why do you ask that? Oh, it seems a little offbeat, Chris. This morning he hires me, then he fires me, then he hires me, now he fires me. Monotonous, isn't it? May I have the check, Mr. Diamond? Not before I call Clinton and ask him a few things. You just don't seem to understand, do you? I want Mr. Clinton to explain. Take your hands away from that phone. Oh, oh, gun, huh? Oh, how I hate him. No need to be afraid of this one unless you get stubborn. Let's give Clinton a ring. Keep your hands on top of the desk, palms down. So we're going to play table tilting, maybe? And stay sitting. Listen, Chris. How do you like your hair parted, Diamond? On the side or right in the middle? (sighs) When I opened my big blue eyes, my office was dark. And the neon light on the hotel across the street flashed the news. It was dark outside, too. I'd been out cold for a long time. When the room stopped spinning, I reached out, grabbed a piece of it, pulled myself up, went to the water cooler, splashed myself alive. I started toward the light switch when... This time, I was going to be ready. I got behind the door and waited. Hey, what's the idea? Hey, let go! Oh, for the love of my God, Sergeant Otis... Well, who you expect, gorgeous George, maybe? <laughs> oh. go my neck. Oh, I'm sorry, Otis. I, I, I guess I just can't resist you. You crazy shamus. Hey, it's dark in here. It was a lot darker a couple of minutes ago. Hit the light, will you? Yeah. Thanks. Oh, I got enough troubles, and the first thing I see when I wake up is you. Holy mackerel. What you been doing with your head, Diamond? I got mixed up in a handball game. Oh? Yeah, some friends needed a ball. It's hard work, but you get used to it. Oh, got worked over, huh? Well, them bum jokes you pull catch up with you sometimes. Yeah, I would... Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing here? I come to get you. Lieutenant Levinson wants to see you. Well, go back and describe me. That's all he gets tonight. I think you better come, Shamus. It's important. I think you better go, Otis. That's important. Now, look... Lieutenant Levinson sends me over to get you. There's something he wants to ask you. All I know is name, rank, and serial number. I go back and tell Walt I don't want to play games. Uh, Shamus, I got news for you. Murder ain't a game no more. That's all Otis would tell me, but I didn't like the way he kept looking at me all the way to see Levinson. Then we got to headquarters, not to Walt's office, but down the long marble corridor that led back to other places. He wants me to bring you back here, Diamond. Where to? The morgue. The morgue? Yeah, you heard of it. I heard of it. What's this all about? You'll see. In here, Shamus. Lieutenant. Back here, Otis. Come on, then. Hello, Rick. I... Well, how's the other head look? I'll let you know when it speaks to me. Yeah. Meantime, I want you to take a look at someone. In here? Yeah, in here. You know who this is, Rick? Oh, the poor little devil. The poor devil. What do you know about him? Well, he was manager of a boarding house. Cheap walk-up on Parker Avenue. That we know. What else? He was murdered, huh? Shot right in the back. Mm. 
Rick, unless I knew you were tied in, I wouldn't have you here. Want to talk about it? Uh, somewhere else, Walt. Sure. Come on. Before I answer any more questions, Walt, how'd you tie me in? He had one of your business cards in his hand. He was shot while he was standing at the phone in the hallway of that boarding house. Did he call you, Rick? I didn't get a call from him. Got any idea why he wanted you? Maybe, maybe not. All depends. On what? Walt, listen. I will in my office. Wait outside, Otis. And I'm busy. Get it? Sure. Sure, I get it. Wait a second, Rick. Now, here's a gun. 38 police special. Take a good look at it. I've seen it before. It's mine. How did you get it? The ballistic support says this gun killed the little guy back there. Did you check it for fingerprints? Yeah, and they were all yours. Hmm. Will you have Otis come visit me and bake a cake with a file in it? Oh, cut it out, Rick. I know you didn't kill him. But I've got to tell the commissioner something. He's funny that way. I was in my office when the guy was shot. I was out cold. You got any proof? For you or the commissioner? For the commissioner, you egghead. Uh, listen on the way. To where? Have Otis bring the car around front. We're going to make a call on a guy named Morris Clinton and his errand boy, Christopher. On the way out, I told Walt the whole thing. How Christopher caught me off base, put me out, and then must have taken my gun to kill the little manager. But neither of us could come up with an answer to why. Why murder to keep me from finding Elaine Tanner? What was the connection between Clinton, his chauffeur, and the girl? I thought maybe Clinton would give her the answers when he learned there was a murder tapping at his door. So you want to see Christopher, Lieutenant Levison? If you don't mind, Mr. Clinton. Oh, no, no, that's all. <clears throat> I'll call him. Real loud, Mr. Clinton. Of course. Christopher? Christopher? You're sure he's here, Mr. Clinton? Yes, yes, I am, of course, Lieutenant. Call again. <clears throat> Christopher? Christopher? I don't think he'll hear you. Why not? I'm not deaf, Mr. Diamond. Hmm? Rick, is that Christopher? Yeah, yeah, this is Chris, all right. And I owe him a haircut. Now, lay off, Rick. I'll handle this. Christopher. Yes, sir? Where were you about two this afternoon? Why, right here, working on the car. Correction. Working on me. I beg your pardon. Oh, come on, come on. Let's have it straight. Mr. Clinton, what about this? Uh, Christopher is, is right within it. Yes, <clears throat> he's right. Oh, you're scared stiff, Clinton, and you're lying. I'm not. I, uh, I wanted to go into town to, to keep an appointment. And the fuel pump on the car was stopped up. I had to take it apart. Oh, yeah. sure. And while you fixed it, Clinton stood right over you. As a matter of fact, he did watch. And it took all afternoon to fix it. No, but when it was finished, it was too late for Mr. Clinton's appointment. Uh, he decided not to go. How about that, Mr. Clinton? Oh, yes, yes, Lieutenant. Uh, Christopher, uh, Christopher hasn't been out of my sight all afternoon. That's good enough for me. All right, Diamond, let's go. What? Are you crazy? No, and that's why I'm putting the cuffs on you. I thought there was something fishy about your story. Gun taken away from you. People coming to see you, hiring you, firing you. Walt, your stomach has gone to your head. Never mind my stomach. Otis. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Put the cuffs on this shamas. Cuffs? On him? Close your mouth, Otis. Put the cuffs on. Walt, what in the world? Diamond, I've been waiting for a chance like this to comb you out of my hair for good. Otis, the cuffs. Uh, yes, sir, Lieutenant. All right, shamas, pull them out. Mr. Clinton, thank you very much. Goodbye. Come on, Diamond. Oh, so, uh, uh, Lieutenant. Otis, I told you to close your mouth. Oh, I gotta breathe. Oh, shut up and come on. Walt, outside, Diamond. Get going. You big bubblehead. What's the idea of making like a cop with me? I kind of liked it. How'd I do? What? Good performance, eh? Good performance. <laughs> oh, you big ham. You great big ham. Well, Lieutenant, are we going to put the shamus in the jug? Shut up, Otis. Take the cuffs off him. What? Here, Otis. Start working. Oh, you're right, Rick. Clinton was scared stiff. And for some reason, he backed Christopher's alibi. Well, I've, uh, I've got an idea. You better have. If I don't have something to tell the commissioner, I'll have to give up my ideas about a pension. I, uh, I'm going back to that boarding house. Why? Well, the manager was going to call me. It's just possible he got a hold of a lead on Elaine Tanner, but Christopher killed him before he had a chance to tell me. Well, that makes sense. Uh, have you got a man there? Yeah, I'm happy. Oh, good. I'll see you later. Rick. All right. Please. For the sake of my stomach, don't slip up. You're my only suspect without an alibi. Thanks, Walt. See you later. Yeah. No, Walt. What? Bottoms up on the bicarbonate. <laughs> That's all the stuff there was in the basement, Diamond. Oh, thanks, Mahaffey. Mm. Everything neatly bundled but this one pile. A little guy must have gone through it. Got any idea what you're looking for? No, give me a hand, will you? Sure. 
Hmm. Newspapers, magazines. Oh, my happy. Uh-huh. No one's been in here since the murder? Nobody. I've been on the door. Oh, and the manager had nothing on him? Only your card. That's funny. Very funny. He wouldn't have tried to call me if he hadn't found something. Maybe he came across something in this pile of stuff. Didn't take it out and then... Find something? Yeah, yeah. This sheaf of withholding tax statements. Mm-hmm. The kind that come on the bottoms of paycheck. Made out to Elaine Tanner, paid by the Blue Falcon Nightclub. That ain't far from here. That's where I'm going. Yeah, sure. Now I remember a kid that named Tanner. Yeah, used to work here on the line. Thanks, bartender. Where's she now? Well, Mr. Me, I know from nothing about her, but she was good friends with one of the dolls in the line, gal named Gladys. Where can I find this Gladys? Dressing room, straight back, turn left. And knock on the door, huh? Well, for oh, they dressed that way for the show anyway. <laughs> I'll keep both eyes closed. <laughs> sure, straight back like I said, and first turn left. <laughs> What you want with her, Hanson? Why don't you get off here? You tip me, sweetheart, but give me a rain check. Who waits for rain? But, um, why do you want to see Elaine? Well, maybe I want to tell her about some oil wells that came in. Yeah? <laughs> you don't look like the type talks about oil wells. Honey, honey, don't let the tassels on my shoes fool you. Oh, you're cute. <laughs> yeah, I know where Elaine is. Want to give? Information? Sure. Oh, you've got a one-track mind. Maybe I can't switch it over yet. Okay, so I'll get a couple of days older meanwhile. Anyhow, I never did like her. So, I don't mind letting you know. No what, Gladys? Well, maybe a month ago she quits this job. This dump. Uh, all right, she quits. Go ahead. Yeah. But uh, before she quits, she's acting funny. Like the night we're going home together, walking along. Ah, oh, this is the last time I take this walk. So, gonna fly to him from work? I'm quitting. Well, if you like to eat grass, go ahead. <laughs> I won't eat grass. Ever had a real mink coat, Gladys? I could have, but his lawyer settled out of court. I'll have one. I'll do all right. You thinking about that guy, Clinton, who comes in the club? Uh-huh. Honey, there's wolves and there's wolves. I want to pick one with teeth. He likes me. Sure. Every time he sees you, he's got to push his eyes back in his head. Chris is working for him. His chauffeur. So this is news, so what? Money. Lots of it. Shake down? Oh, now look, honey, they can give you trouble for that. <laughs> Not a shakedown. This is safe and sure. Chris figured it. He figured it and I... And what? Nothing. Just forget it. Come on, let's get some coffee. And that's all she says. Uh-huh. Now, where can I find her? Oh, I'll tell you where I think she is. Here's the address. I wrote it down. Thanks, Gladys. I'll see you again. Yeah. See more of me. Is that possible? This costume's for the first show. We save up for the second. I'll be here for the last show. Oh, what you said. So long, Hampton. A little while after Gladys gave the address, I was buzzing at an apartment door. I kept my fingers crossed and then uncrossed them when the door opened. Yes? Hello there, Elaine. Who are you? Oh, the name's Hangtooth. Elmer Hangtooth. Who? Oh, I better come in. Hey, hey, what's the idea? Oh, can't hear a thing you say, honey. My hearing aid just shorted out. Now, listen, wise guy. Oh, Elaine, Elaine. Chris sent me. Chris? Yeah. He said to tell you everything's okay. The heat's off. How about that private eye? Diamond? Richard Diamond? Yeah, that's the one. Honey, you'll never be any closer to him than you are right now. Uh, I was afraid he'd quit. Hey, when's Chris coming? Soon, I hope. Oh. Uh, I've never seen you before, have I? Well, you're young and life's full of surprises. Uh-huh. I like surprises. Nice. Chris, work you in on the deal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did him a favor. Took care of Diamond. Like doing it, too. Oh. Well, by the way, what goes with you and Clinton? <laughs> Honey, we had a common interest. Oh. Books, dearie. Books. Hmm. He had one I wanted. <laughs> When I finished with him, I could have walked out with a furniture. Yeah, I guess you could, baby. I guess you could. Think so? Why not? Uh, what did you say your name was? Well, the name's Oppenacher, Harold Oppenacher. But uh, that's not what you said before. Oh, so you have been listening. The real name is Diamond, Richard Diamond. 
I see a kidder, huh? Well, if that makes you laugh, this ought to bring back Mahjong. Here, take a look at my license. Huh? My membership card, the Hopalong Cassidy Club, my Flash Gordon beanie. You dirty shamash, you stinking cop. Easy, baby. Let go, easy, baby. Easy. Let go, you dirty. Let go. Let her go, Diamond. Chris. Chris. Jackpot. Chris and Elaine all at once. Diamond, get your hands off her. Get them off. No. That's better. Huh. Now, Elaine, before I fill him full of holes, huh. tell me what he's doing here. He, he said just sent him, Chris. Sure, he would. Elaine, you ready to get out of here? Yeah. Okay, hand me a cushion from the sofa. Want to take a nap, Chris? I'll laugh at your funeral, Shamus. Hold a cushion over the gun. Nobody hears the shot. Better not, Chris. Elaine, start out. I'll be right behind you. Yeah, all right, Chris. Got the book? Yeah. What book? Shut up. Get going, Elaine. Chris, uh, let's talk this over. Funny, you just finished talking, Diamond. Chris! Elaine, what's Elaine, the matter? Give me my book. Give it to me. Clinton. Clinton, duck. Get out of the way. Diamond, you. Oh, Chris. Well, I, I owed him that partner's hair. It's all right, Elaine. Just creased. I wouldn't think of depriving the hot seat of such a good customer. My book. Where's my book? I want it. Give me my book. Give sure, me... sure, sure, Mr. Clinton. But I'm afraid you'll have to explain to the police first. A telephone call to the 5th Precinct brought Walt and Otis to my rescue. Otis used the siren. Loved it. I told Walt the book old man Clanton kept screaming about had me a little confused and that I wouldn't be able to relax until he found out just where it fitted in the case. He promised to find out the answers as soon as he took Chris, Elaine, and Clanton back to the 5th Precinct. I told him to call me in Helen's. Rick, what about that check for $1,000? Is it any good? Well, the check's post-dated. I doubt if Mr. Clanton will honor it now. It's too bad. We, we could have celebrated. So all you got for your trouble was 100 a day in expenses. Mm, I'll get it. Grant's tomb, the general speaking. Rick? Yeah, Walt? Yeah, you sitting down? Why? You can tear up that check Clinton gave you. He won't honor it. He's mad about having to go to jail. Oh, I was way ahead of you about the check. Why did Clinton go to jail? What did he do? You know that book he was yelling about? What about it? Well, it's an original Sir Francis Bacon manuscript. How would you know? I hate to admit it, but Otis told me what it was. You know, Otis is a... a, 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 a uh, excuse me, Lieutenant. It's bibliophile. Shut up, Hammerhead. Okay, so I work for nothing. Uh, Rick. Yeah? The book was worth $30,000. It was stolen 18 years ago from the Fine Arts Library in Washington. Old man Clinton bought it from a fence. That's why he couldn't go to the police. Oh, so Chris and Elaine uh, hijacked it, huh? Probably had a sale for it. Yeah, uh, Rick. There's a $1,500 reward for that book. So what? It's yours. Hmm? Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Walt. Helen. Hmm? Put your ear next to the receiver. Oh, all right. Walt, say that again. Say what again? What you just said. Did I say anything? Well, sure you did. Are you sure? Oh, now cut it out, Walt. Say it again about the reward. Oh, that. There's a $1,500 reward for the book. Thanks, Walt. Bye. Bye. Well, baby. Well, we're going to celebrate after all. $1,500. Oh, Rick, that calls for a real celebration. Sure. Well, don't go away, darling. I'll be right back. I won't be long. Oh, uh, Rick, there's a new song on the piano. Why don't you try it? Okay, oh, I set my pajamas and put on my prayers. Well, that's pretty silly, but... Hmm. My baby kissed me goodnight And I am glad to relate That by the time I got home I was feeling great I climbed up the door and opened the stairs I said my pajamas and put on my prayers I turned off the bed Crawled into the light And all because you kissed me Good night Next morning I awoke And scrambled my shoes I shined up an egg Then I toasted the news I buttered my tie And took another bite And all because you kissed me Good night By evening I felt normal So we went out again you said goodnight and kissed me, I hurried home and then I climbed up the door and opened the stairs I said my pajamas and put on my prayers I turned off the bed, crawled into the light And all because you kissed me, <coughs> goodnight By evening I felt normal, so we went out again you said goodnight and kissed me, I hurried home and then I lifted the preacher, 
called up the phone, spoke to the dog and I threw your ma a bone. It was midnight and yet the sun was shining bright and I think I'll just kiss me. Good night. Oh, that was lovely, Rick. Well, how do I look? Oh, my, my, wonderful. What are you dressed up for? For the celebration. Oh, that's right, yeah. Come on, let's go. Oh, where are we going, Rick? Oh, the Blue Falcon nightclub. We'll be just in time for the last show. The Blue Falcon? Oh, but why pick that play? Oh, but they've got a wonderful floor show. Yes, but the costumes are... Oh, they're nothing. Oh, what you said. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Francis Robinson, Ted Osborne, Gene Bates, and Paul Dubov. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Today's show was written and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC today? Ezio Pinza, dynamic singing star, plays his first starring dramatic role today on Theater Guild on the Air, with Madeline Carroll and Linda Darnell co-starred. And you'll also want to listen to the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show and the Adventures of Sam Spade right before Theater Guild. Don't forget, it's the Opinza on Theater Guild on the Air today. It's all great entertainment today on NBC. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. NBC.